Vladimir Volchkov in the blue. We're so proud to have him. 22 years ago this week, this man qualified for Wimbledon with three three out of five set matches and then just kept rolling, and he beat. I was like, who is this Vladimir Volchkov guy? He beat all these great players. Byron Black, right? Cedric Piolin, Yunus Elenawi. Uh, Piolin had Wins been... To, Wayne Ferreira, I think. Oh, yeah, Wayne Ferreira, huge forehand, and he's actually at Wimbledon right now coaching yeah. uh, a friend of a friend of ours, Francis Tiafo. So, uh, That's right. yeah. Vladimir, it's such an honor and a pleasure to have you as our Wimbledon kickoff show, and uh, you are all the way in Turkey, Istanbul, so you, it's 6 in the morning, and we are grateful you've gotten up so early to join us. Thank you very much for inviting, for inviting me, guys. Thank what you. a pleasure. Well, Craig Bell is next yeah. to me. Um, producing and getting our Facebook feed live uh, and, and going and YouTube as well. So uh, if you're watching us live, chime in to the comments. We will uh, yes. incorporate some of your questions. We, of course, have a run sheet. We're usually going three sets with most guests, but this is a mm -hmm. bit special, and yes. it's Wimbledon. We're going five sets tonight. We're going to have a great time with this man. Here we go. Uh, in the meantime, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Greg Bell is live. Let's get this yes. podcast started with the music. Here we go. James Scott Campbell. to another episode of the At The Net podcast, powered by Texmo Productions. Working the soundboards in the back of the house are our producers, D-Mac and Dave the Brain. Time to say hello to your hosts, Craig Bell and AJ Shabria, as they're about to take us through three sets of tennis, talking life and all the news as it seems to them. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Bell. All right there. Uh, thanks, to our Ethernet podcast girl, the convivial, Margot Carter. That she now, I is. worked in the convivial. That's two convivials tonight. Convivial right from the Latin with life. That's right. Love it. For that, mm. you know what the word of the day is, though? It's brilliant. 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 I tell you. That, you know, that's brilliant. two weeks in a row we've had brilliant. Because we have brilliant. We have a brilliant guest here. And we'll introduce him here in a second. But welcome, fans of the great game. You're listening to season one, episode one, two, two. It's been right at about three years now, I believe. Almost three years. Almost three years. episodes. Yes, of Athenet Podcast with AJ Chabria, a.k.a. AJC, right? Is that, that would you? be me. And yeah. next to me, to my right, Craig Bell, the great CB1, as we call him. And we were talking the great game of tennis, as, as it, it seems, seems to us. us. Thanks also go out to our good amigos at Tex-Mex Productions. That'd be one Darian D. Mac McBrayer and Dave the Brain. We did have a brain sighting. The brain was in the house for a short period of time. He's not on the phone anymore, but yeah. we did see the brain. Uh, and uh, he was on the soundboard for a second. He actually had to give me the password. He, oh, good. He didn't let me have the keys to the car yet, you know. So I just uh, control freak, man. That is, you know, he just doesn't let me know. You know, I don't know why, you know, mm -hmm. but anyway, uh, we're actually uh, live right now and not Memrix. We're not holograms. Uh, as John Yandel says, we can't afford to be holograms yet, but someday we're going to be there, right? We will. All right. Also, be sure to like us and follow us on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Plus, check out our good work on. <sighs> Fireside, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Anchor Breaker, CastBox, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and Spotify. I did it again. I'm three for three. Well I think. done, buddy. Last three weeks. Basically, it's all the important communication sites the kids find popular today, right? Correct. And we'll know. If Craig doesn't get those through those 10, he may have some respiratory thing or COVID or whatever. It might be or, or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But so you're healthy. I'm, I'm proud. I'm, he I'm healthy right now. Healthy as a horse, as they say. Yes. As the old saying goes from Oklahoma. You know, that's an Oklahoma saying, you know. Healthy as a horse. We have a lot of horses out there, right? Yeah. Do we? Okay. Down here, too. Also, if uh, you'd like to be like the convivial Margot Carter and, and read the opening intro, AJ will uh, uh, go through all the people who send him maybe an intro. DMs, emails, whatever. Right. Uh, yeah. Send me a demo tape and we'll work with you. Yep. So hit, hit him up. Also, uh, if you'd like to have your voice message read, like in a voice, AJ does some really good voices, Vladimir. We'll let you hear a few here in a second. But uh, I... I will put on Facebook here tonight, uh, maybe or even tomorrow, my voice message that AJ is going to leave for me. And I'm going to use Rafael Nadal, you know, okay? The Rafael Nadal. Uh, uh -huh. Well, Vladimir is here, no? And uh, you've reached Craig Bell's cell phone, no? I'm going to work hard. I'm going to get him the message. He's going to call you back, no? It's yes. going to be great. And uh, very, bravo. Very, very, very happy to be here, no? <laughs> bravo, bravo. What, what about this, Uncle Tony? It, 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 sound, it far, sounds very reasonable, you know? It sounds very. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like very, 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 very like that. Very yes. 
So, so we, I, I knew you might like that. So he's got a couple of more. So we'll, we'll throw a couple out there. But speaking of brilliant right. guests this evening, our, our guest this evening is certainly a brilliant uh, oh, former yeah. player. Bobby still is a decent player in his own right. Still, even this day, he might be able to crack that serve at big, a, big hitter, the Vladiator. That's right, the Vladiator. That would be <laughs> Vladimir Volchkov, all the way from Turkey at six in the morning. We appreciate uh, you you chatting with us at about six fifteen local time. Yeah, uh, man, I can't believe you're up here, but thank you very much uh, for uh, accepting this uh, opportunity. You know, we're excited. We, you know, AJ and I have been talking about this for a couple of weeks, and we just, uh, you know, are really excited to have you on, talk to you about uh, all the things you've been doing, you know, uh, right now, and then also talking about Wimbledon and, and what your thoughts mm-hmm. are, you know, coming up uh, uh, at the, uh, you know, the, this fortnight coming up for 2022, right? Love it. And um, let's get right into the first set. Who is this sponsored by, Craig Bell? Uh, that would be the one Conga Sports. The uh, first green tennis network. Yes, the first green tennis network. So check out our good friend Rich Nair and Conga Sports, right? We mm-hmm. knew him from Tennis Club Business, and this is an amazing new venture. So go, do go check that out. And, uh, yeah, the first set is all about the background of our guest, uh, Vladimir Volchkov. Vladimir, how did you get started in the great game up in Minsk, Belarus? Uh, well, I haven't. Uh, I have to say that I haven't had much of a chance uh, to choose between two sports. It was either tennis or swimming, and the reason is uh, we had a huge uh, tennis school uh, right at the entrance of the big uh, factory, like um, um, uh, car pro- uh, uh, truck production plantry called Maz. And this is where my mom and dad worked. So literally every day, like eight in the morning, they would walk in and then four in the afternoon, they would walk out and, and every time they walk past the tennis courts. So, you know, when you're doing that a year or two, and then you're, you have a son and uh, obviously he's going to do some sports because back in the USSR, all, like most of the kids, they started doing sports one or the other. So there was only choice of the tennis courts and the next destination he was uh, passing by was a swimming pool. So I I had to be one or the other. And uh, the first time uh, my first coach, uh, Slava, uh, came uh, came to our school, he was sitting in this uh, gym classes. And then, uh, you know, I saw who is this guy? You know, he he was a little bit like uh, outstanding, like a... uh, young, uh, like in a good physical shape with yeah. the Adidas, uh, with the Adidas uh, clothing, the shoes. I'm like, man, this guy, who is he? Is he some scout or what? Some sports. And then uh, he invited us to kind of like a uh, uh, first training to see if we like it or not. And I just fell in love with the sport. You know, first of all, I had a lot of admiration for the coach because I saw that this guy is something that I want to be like. He was very outstanding from like a general uh, uh, physical education teachers or just like if you look out of the street, he was very outstanding, very modern looking, very like uh, different. So, and I said, man, this is, uh, I want to be like this guy. And then uh, it happened to be that I like uh, action a lot. You know, he was uh, very smart the way he showed us tennis. He didn't just give us a tennis racket in the hand. But actually, the first time we saw a tennis court was uh, almost a year and a half after I started playing. So we did all this, uh, all this coordination exercises, running around, uh, spinning around, learning to move different ways, toss balls, left hand, right hand, hit the ball against the wall. So I, uh, years later, as I went into coaching and I started to think through all the things that uh, we did uh, back when I was young, uh, I take my head off for the fundamentals that he laid in me because actually by the time we started getting into the tennis technique, I, was, I had a very good uh, movement base. You know, it was easier to adopt the tennis technique and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty unbelievable. So uh, the, the literally a month later, uh, a teacher from swimming came to our school and they said that we also want to give you like a test lesson. So they've, uh, they went around uh, the uh, gym classes and they selected some of the guys who they thought that could uh, have like potential in swimming. And uh, yeah, and then we did our first or second swimming uh, class. But uh, you could not compare because just like a four young uh, seven year old boy, you know, running around, screaming, tossing balls around, uh, chasing someone and just getting in the water, staying like this, you know, there was not much to choose from. No contest. 
no 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 contest yeah. and then it's also like you have to understand that back in ussr uh we we did not understand it yet but even we felt like tennis was a very outstanding uh, kind of sport and uh a kind of like a door to a different reality and uh yes i took that i took that uh the jump with my dad and uh, it became the thing that i do in love and uh, i never regret it it gave me most of my pleasures most of my tears as well but uh, you know it may be it makes me the man i am flattering that's tremendous what was slava's last name uh konikov he was actually a head coach at the uh, sacramento state college almost 10 or 15 years he was based in uh, california uh-huh. and i'm sure that in uh in uh in uh, sacramento like that uh, northern Cal- california region people know him a lot he was uh uh, up until uh, last couple of years, uh, uh, I was actually lucky to get him f- to work in Belarus for a year. And then uh, he was coaching uh, this Christina Dmitruk, who I think did finals at the US Open Junior Girls recently, like a year or two ago. And then he was uh, traveling with her for a while. So I don't really know uh, what he's doing, what his next project is. He had a birthday yesterday. Uh, but he's a man of the game. He absolutely loves this game. At his age, he still looks like unbelievable fit. And I actually, he's definitely the guy to look up to. And uh, yeah, I wish him well. He is what, 60-something now? I definitely remember him from Sac State before before you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you said he's, Slava, he's, it's either uh-huh. Kornikov or Dozadel. And I thought Dozadel yeah. is, he's not the right age. He's too young to be your coach. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, so yes. I, I, I actually remember. I actually remember playing Slava in uh, back at the French playing serving volley and clay, which was uh, which was uh, pretty interesting. Pretty interesting to see. The only thing is, uh, at that time, it was very strong division between the clay quarters and the uh, and the indoor guys. So every time you saw a guy serving volley on a clay court, you're like, okay, this guy, guy is out in this round. And then it was the same thing when those clay quarters came to play indoors. You were like, okay, yeah. this is an easy draw. Yeah, this is easy. <laughs> this guy is four meters back. I'm going to kill him. Yeah. It's funny <laughs> now, true. though, because now the grass seems slow and the clay seems a bit faster and the ball, uh, there's, a le- there's a lot less of that surface mm-hmm. specializing than, than there was in your mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also think, uh, well, first of all, you're very correct about this. And uh, I also think that uh, actually the type of players changed a lot. So I think when they moved, uh, when they kind of uh, made the, the hard courts a little bit kind of slower. And then uh, uh, if you remember, I think Tim Henman and uh, Max Mirna were basically the last two guys to serve in volley. They were like the dying uh, dinosaurs. And uh, the game became very kind of uh, more of unified. If you look at these guys now, they're all very all, 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 uh, all around, all arounders. You know, they can be very solid from the, from the baseline. Most of them serve well. Uh, the only problem is, I think, uh, uh, because the hard courts, uh, they kind of, uh, the, uh, because even indoors, they're not played on such surf, such fast surfaces anymore. Uh, the game in general, I think it slowed down a little bit. Mm. So now as a class of players, there are a little bit less players who are aggressively coming in. Even though, honestly, I think in the last, uh, in the last three years, uh, a new generation is coming in. And uh, they're going to be tough. I think uh, there is a few guys who are moving uh, uh, by how they're constructing the game in the right direction. And I think some uh, few good years are coming in after, of course, if they're able to catch up with uh, with Rafa and Novak. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. We love seeing the attacking and the variety. Uh, let's get back to the surface a little bit. Mm-hmm. In uh, in your amazing run, winning three quality matches and then five main draw matches, and then mm-hmm. losing to one of the all time greats, Pete Sampras, in the semifinal of the main draw gentlemen singles, that was the older, faster grass. Is that correct? 
Yes, it was it was a faster grass, and uh, I could tell that in the semifinal. Uh, I don't know if you if you remember, but statistically, in the semifinal, played hundred percent the serve and volley. Wow. So all the three sets, first or second serve, everything statistically, he played serve and volley. Uh, some year, some time after, I found out that this was uh, due to some of his like a small like a thigh injury. So he just didn't want to keep the rallies uh, long. But to me, it was like a biggest, uh, biggest surprise and stress because I just, I, I, it was first time in my life that I saw someone uh, serving volley hundred percent. I mean, you're looking for your chances, and I have to say that I felt pretty confident from the back, and I said, "Come on, I, I gotta find ways to keep this guy at the baseline a little bit." Yeah. But then, you know, a few times that I was, uh, the, maybe like. 10, 50 times when I was able to hit a good return and put the ball down to his feet, he would just like play the huge pickup volley or uh, the, a nice volley and how fast the ball takes off, you literally can, cannot chase it. And uh, yes, the courts were, the courts at least they played a lot faster. And I could also tell that uh, in the qualifying rounds, you know, and, uh, but that, uh, that grass suited me, I, I guess a lot better because I just, you know, the, the uh, we grew up, we grew up back in USSR training on those, uh, wood floors, very wood fast floors. Exactly. Like, wow. like the, like they use in the States where, where the guys play basketball and you can just imagine how the ball skips off that surface. So, and, and this is the surface we grew up on, you know, you're hitting, uh, uh, six months a year, a year you're hitting against the wall, thousands and thousands of balls, and then at the end of the practice, you know, you get uh, four sets of two guys to hit uh, across the net. So you have like two and a half meters until the butt of the next guy. So you have to <laughs> play so accurately, so you actually don't hit him because he might hit you back. You know, so and this is the conditions where you grew up, and then uh, obviously all these balls are staying very low, and you you want it or not, but you're gonna have your hand speed extremely fast, and uh, you know. So the, the and actually the only tournament that uh, I remember me and my dad we were watching like at uh, 11 p.m. or 12 p.m. You know, the, the sports did not get. Uh, I mean, they got a lot of attention, but not exactly tennis. So we would have to wait until 11 p.m. or 12 p.m., almost at midnight, to watch one set of uh, Wimbledon to to see who's playing and to even to hear the voices of commentators who, to us, after we grew up, they were, they, they felt like the, the, they're gods or something. I'm you know, sure. And yeah. And I'm telling you these stories. I still like all these <laughs> memories flooded back. <laughs> I can tell you can feel it. Uh, Metrovelli, Alex Metrovelli, right? That's right. That's yeah, right. amazing player in the 70s. And you were watching these one-hour or one-set matches or, or packages um, mm -hmm. on USSR TV. This was, what, 1980-something when you were a kid? Uh, so I was born in 78, and I had to be around uh, 8, uh, let's say 8, 9, 10. So that means that it was like 80, 87, 88, 89, yeah. that, that, that time. And we were just there on the, the TV. Oh, these guys are playing. It was, it was amazing. It was, honestly, it was like uh, watching the dream. Yeah, and then uh, so sometimes it almost like I feel I could perhaps do a little more in in a sport, but I have to say that I guess I reached uh, my dream, and the only thing is that uh, I could tell the younger guys is dream bigger because if you work hard enough and you if your dream is honest, dreams do come true. If your dream is honest, that's such a uh, an important point that sometimes people forget to say. You know, they talk about follow your heart and dream big and follow your dreams. Yeah. But if your dream is honest, that's a, a takeaway for me there. I like that. Hey, yes. uh, when you were 9, 10, 11, and it was mid, late 80s, and you're watching tennis on the television for only one hour, who were the big influences on you? Was it Edberg, Becker? Who, who, was, uh, who were your favorites at, at, the little, at the little kid stage? Uh, obviously, uh, obviously, it was uh, it was uh, more. Uh, it was not really the, the McEnroe type guys. It was more like Landl, and I personally had uh, felt like emotional connection to Becker mm. because I felt like this guy is really. He was. Uh, he. 
like how he played i like what he did first of all he, you could tell the emotions there was uh real power there was uh a lot of grace mm. and uh i also liked uh edberg but to me becker i guess was at that time more favorite because i i kind of felt more of a human being inside him you could see how the emotions are going through how he's handling them but also the game was very straightforward aggressive but yet with a lot of athleticism to extend where it becomes beauty mm. obviously roger took it to absolutely next level he the, the guy became like a ballet dancer on the court but at that time i think like especially being a big guy like boris becker yeah. was and that kind of athleticism and all those dives and everything, this was like, this was catching the breath. And actually the reason why at my Wimbledon, I was diving a lot is because I was, uh, yeah, I was, uh, uh, th this was, was uh, in my eyes. This was in my heart. And uh, this is how you play on grass. You know, sometimes you take a dive, you fly, and then uh, it just feels unbelievable. Actually, you know, the, the, the feeling as you're flying through the air, reaching the ball, it's like, I don't know how else you can show that I'm giving everything I have, all my heart and all my passion to the game. It's just such a good feeling, you know, it's all the honesty there. And uh, it was, uh, wow, well, you know, so Bor I guess uh, Boris was uh, my favorite guy at that time. Uh, but funny enough, the more I grew up, of course, uh, I watched some of the older matches. Uh, I mean, not older matches, but I watched some of the uh, Johnny Mac game and uh, the talent of this guy is absolutely through the roof, through the roof. Like how he saw the game, how he played the game, how he tricked your mind. How I mean, it was amazing. Uh, Vladimir, I've hit with John twice, and um, the guy who kind of set us up said, hey, I know you're a good player, but McEnroe will warp the time-space continuum. And that's basically what you just said. Like, you think you just hit huge, and it's going to come float, and I'm going to take a forehand. And no, the ball comes, and it skids, and it's like about to hit me in the hip, and I'm just reacting. Uh, that guy was unbelievable, too. Uh, yes. Becker and, and John, yeah. Um, yes, he was he was a perfect player to make you hit a lot of balls from the positions that you are not trained to hit them. And uh, yes, there, there 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 are always a few guys in the game. Even though honestly, I think right now a little bit less of them. But uh, even in my age, guys like Santoro, like if a few guys, I'm, I'm it's not easy to name too many now. But yeah. uh, even around challenger levels, they're always uh, these guys who are going to make you hit uncomfortable balls. And then uh, when you're not really in the game from the side, you look, how is this guy playing in the ATP house? He's playing in the main draw of Grand Slams. And that's exactly the answer because he makes the guys hit so many balls from the positions that they're not working on that, uh, you know, that's why he's there. That's how he's, he's at that level, yeah. Um, last couple of questions. Uh, can you take us through your feelings in two things? One, um, doubles with Max Mirny in Davis mm -hmm. Cup, and also mm -hmm. Wimbledon. Uh, how did you um, how did you feel like you belonged at that level, and how did you go from being uh, you know kind of the number two guy on the Davis Cup team mm -hmm. to being the guy you know leading on any surface? You mentioned earlier pre-show you were mm -hmm. talking about training in Spain, and my of course second part of this is take us through man going through qualies and going all the way to the semis on grass. That's amazing. Yes. Uh, so, uh, with Max, uh, with Max and the Davis cup, uh, we've, uh, uh, it was actually pretty interesting because even though the normal Davis cup team consists of four players, but we always knew that, that there's only two of us who are going to be at the world level, at least where the, where the team was, we were always fighting to get to the world group and we actually got there. And uh, it's all due to our, uh, basically, our tennis. So we knew that, uh, you know, if we don't want to physically exhaust ourselves for the third day, we have to do it in two. Otherwise, it's going to be, it's going to be like almost impossible because, you know, on tour, uh, if you play a five setter in the first day and then exhausting doubles next one, you're going to be dead for the third day. And uh, that made, made us strong. That made us unite a lot. Mm. And, uh, 
we, we actually did create a special a special bond. Like the things we've been through in Davis Cups with Max is absolutely amazing. We played a lot of teams, a lot of surfaces, and uh, we actually beat in Davis Cup. We beat a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of pretty good teams. And um, of course, we lost to the top guys, top doubles players. I remember we played uh, John Lafney, Dieger, and then uh, another guy, Adams from South Africa. It was uh, tough to play because they were just like doubles guys at that time. And then, of course, we played the Bryan brothers uh, at the, uh, ah, that was Olympics. And then uh, a few other like really strong teams where I was, I felt like I didn't belong there. I was never like a super doubles player. Uh, but uh, as, lo- as soon as we played someone who was one good, good doubles player in the team and another one uh, like a singles player, we could kind of work it, uh, work, work, through, work through it because Max always told me the secrets of the doubles guys and I could always like handle my, my part. So it was always like uh, who's going to outsmart the other side. And yeah. the funniest thing was when we played uh, some of the matches against Max's former partner. Okay, so he knew everything. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then this was interesting. And then, uh, of course, uh, another funny part became, not funny, but interesting, uh, when I was already a Davis Cup captain and mm. Max was still playing doubles. Oh, so wow. that was some part of a chess game because I already knew what he's going to do. Max knew what some of the opponents are capable of. And then we're sitting there. It actually felt like actually three guys are playing against, against two. two yeah. I felt myself like a player still. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it, was, uh, it, it was fun. And then uh, obviously winning a few really good uh, doubles matches in the Davis Cup, naturally uh, there, was a, uh, there was a point in, I think, uh, exactly around 2001 where Max uh, did not have a partner for a short period of time. And I said, listen, let's uh, play a few weeks together. And uh, right after Wimbledon, he actually won. Uh, uh, yeah, right after Wimbledon, he we had to go to play Davis Cup somewhere, so we played the Challenger. Uh, so we had a few wins, and then I said, you know, let's let's give it a try. And then we played the semifinal in Hertogen Bosch, I think, or was it uh, some uh, some grass tournament somewhere before Wimbledon? We played the semifinal there, and then uh, went to the semifinals in in the doubles in two thousand one as well. Until we hit the probably the best doubles team at that time. It was uh, who was it? It was uh, um, it was uh, Johnson Dieger, perhaps Johnson Dieger. They 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 were the first one to really play that I formation ah. on constant basis, and it was very awkward. I mean, was it, it was uh, like, was it Don Johnson and uh, Jared Palmer? Jerry Palmer. That's, that's the right. one. Yes, okay. Yes. yes. They were amazing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And of course, Jared was an extremely talented, yeah. uh, talented player. And, uh, uh, and Don Johnson, you know, they, they had, first of all, they had a very good team. They were communicating well. And uh, it was uh, like literally, again, these guys played almost 100% I formation. And it was mind bugging. It, it's not something. It's not something that uh, people do every time. And on the way to that semifinal, we beat a few like solid teams. I'm not saying super high, but a few solid teams. Mm-hmm. And because the grass suited both of us, uh, both of us and Max and me. And uh, even in that match, I thought we had a few chances. I think we lost four sets. Three of them went uh, in tiebreakers, so it was pretty close. But yeah. You know, it's just tough when all the all the big points, the guys, okay, this guy's at the net again. Where is he going to jump? <laughs> Left or right? Left or right, it's yeah. Non- non-stop, non-stop. You want to have somehow like even in the tennis match, when you're going through the match, you have a little bit of a relief on your serve. You know, you have a, hit the big serve, finish with the forehand, and then you're trying to really concentrate to break the guy. But here it's like constantly there are chances. You feel like there are chances. But they're not because they <laughs> they're reading the game so well, and it's a constant, constant brainstorming. It's it's uh, you know it wears you out. In in doubles, um, I know Max is maybe five six inches taller, and he had the amazing one hander. You yeah. with the huge forehand and double handed backhands, but yeah. also good slice returns. Did you play deuce or add, or did you mix it up? 
Uh, I played on a, I played on the ad side yeah. here because uh, at that time uh, the kick serve was a big thing. Yeah. Of course, it did not work well on the grass. The ball did not pick up that much. But, uh, you know, playing on the ad court, it teached me, like, to handle the back and return down the feet so well. And yeah. I just loved it. I don't know. Yeah, this. I either had it, I always put the ball down to the server's feet. Uh -huh. Or if I'm late, I just go flat down the line. Down the end, and yeah. everything, this thing on grass, it comes naturally. So when you're in the, catching the ball in front enough, you're going to hit a good return to the server. If you're a little bit late, it's going to be a bomb down the line. And then if, uh, you know, if they go kind of your body, you just like block the ball right above the middle. Yeah. So I don't know, everything came pretty naturally uh, considering my uh, background. And then anytime I had a little bit extra time, I was going to run to hit my forehand. Yeah, it's a huge. And basically, if I, if I hit that that if I hit that forehand, if I was in a good position, I didn't really care where, where I hit it. You were banging it, man. I remember this. Yeah. That's so uh, so take us through uh, qualifying and how you. Be, I mean, I, I'm mostly uh, I became very aware of you when you mm -hmm. beat Pioline, and I believe mm -hmm. three years before that match. He mm -hmm. went all the way to the final of Wimbledon and lost to Pete Sampras. And here you are beating a very stylish French guy who can play yes. on any fast court. How did you beat him? And then how did you keep rolling? Like, you didn't just like, oh, good, I beat Pioline, and then you chill. You kept playing better and better against Ferreira, Elenawi, guys like this. And uh, But before we're going to Pioline, I'm going to tell you the story that you're going to like for I sure. I love it. I love it. So, so I was there with my dad, and uh, I just qualified. I beat, uh, I beat. Uh, I, I actually, I don't remember who was the last uh, round of qualifiers. So uh, I, I, we had, to, we finished by Thursday, and I said that I think the draw should be coming out soon. Please go check the draw. So my draw, is, my dad is walking around checking the draw. Him, okay, you play this guy, uh, Puerta, and I'm like, oh, so the lefty. So the next uh, two days, I'm constructing my practices where I hit with the lefties. Yeah. So two days, I'm getting myself ready for the for the lefty, and then a day before, I'm I'm just like out of looking for something else, and I see I'm playing uh, Juan Ignacio Chela. Mm -hmm. I'm like that. I'm not playing Puerta. I'm playing Chela. Said, well, what's the difference? He's also Argentina. 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 Argentina I'm like that. The, the difference is that Puerta is playing lefty and <laughs> Chelsea is playing right <laughs> to start with. <laughs> and then actually, I think it was also a five setter there, yeah. uh, perhaps. I, I, yeah. And uh, he was he was uh, actually a tough cookie to beat. He was, I think, top 20 player at that time. And uh, he had a pretty big serve. He could defend well. But of course, uh, when it's when you're beating someone like Piolin level, it tells you that you can be really dangerous uh, against the top guys on grass, not just play a few good matches. Yeah. And, and why? Because Cedric had a very good game for the grass. You know, he had a one-hand or backhand, which always helps if you if you have a good one. And he had a good, like, swinging forehand. He had a great slice to come in, and he had a good touch at the net. So he had everything it takes to play good on the grass. Mm. The only thing is uh, actually one of the guys uh, from the tour, perhaps it was, I don't remember who, he said that, uh, you know, play your game and wait until the moment where... Maybe he just gets a little bit uh, tired of uh, playing and beating someone he doesn't know. Ah. You know he's, he's a top-level guy, and then he probably never seen you play or something. And then eventually, if the match is going and going deep, and then he's like, who am I playing here? You know, yeah. just wait... Uh, wait uh, until he gets he starts maybe doubting himself a little bit a few mistakes come in and then and then just keep keep pushing so it was i could understand that tennis wise it was tough to beat him but if i stay consistent if i fight hard you always you you you, you get the guy to a breaking point and then it's it's very even and this is actually what i've learned also on uh, playing a lot on grass is that uh, grass kind of uh, takes a lot of the advantages of many top guys like super fitness or uh, taking away some of their great weapons because everything happens so fast. And on grass, uh, once you get someone to a tiebreaker, it's really becomes very like very even, you know, it's literally a couple of points here and there that mm -hmm. will decide. And actually I took it uh, with me 
to the rest of my career. You know, even if you're playing a top guy, get him to the point where he starts becoming a, a normal guy. You know, he walks into the court as a champion. You get Becker or someone at uh, to six hole in a tiebreaker, and then the rankings doesn't matter. You know, this is uh, this is actually what happened to me. Uh, also with Boris, with my uh, actually childhood hero, yeah. I came to play. Uh, I came to play a tournament in Chennai in India. Uh-huh. I qualified there, and uh, I'm playing Boris. And I think he just. Uh, it was either at that time, I think it was after the Australia, Australian Open, and I think he played he either won or or he played the final there. I mean, he came out there with all those lot of clothing and everything. I'm not sure if Bolitieri came with him, but so we we played there. Now walking to the center court to play my idol, I'm like, <laughs> no, what's gonna happen now? And and it's not like this guy is gonna let you play. You know, he's gonna serve in volley, he's gonna hit big forehands. So I said, listen, what can we do now? At least let's concentrate on surf, hit big surfs. From your big surf, you're going to get easier ball. Mm. Finish them off. Let's take the guy to the tiebreaker. And this is what happened. You know, we played a very competitive match. It was, uh, I think, uh, either 7-6, 7-6, or even a three-setter. And that uh, that was something that I took from grass. You take a top guy to five all. Six five, six hole, and then anything can happen there. And as long as you believe in yourself, as long as you prepare for those short, like short patches where you can really uh, step in and still uh, do the right stuff. Because obviously, what happens is, uh, you know, sometimes when you're playing a top guy, you think, oh, maybe you want to go for too much, and this is where you miss. But if you're actually getting to the boiling, to the breaking point and still stay disciplined and execute well what you can, that's your chance. That's it. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Craig, Craig is our research department, yeah. and he looked up who you played yeah. in, in the qualies. Yeah, Julian uh, Noli. Julian in, in Nola, the, the German the Austrian, uh, Austrian guy. guy. Yeah. Yes, Austrian. you beat him in, in, the, in the last match to qualify. Uh, and you beat yes. uh, Anthony Dupuy? Dupuy, the Dupuis. Frenchman, yeah. And then yes. uh, yes. you beat a Japanese guy, Satoshi Iwabuchi, in the first Iwabuchi. round. Iwabuchi. Iwabuchi, Iwabuchi. Yeah. Satoshi. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I was sitting there. I was like, when you said, you know, I can't remember who I played in the uh, So I, that's why I was sitting there going really fast. And I was like, okay, I found. That was, you had some tough qualifying. I mean, you, yeah. you lost a few sets on your way there. It wasn't an easy, easy go of it. I was just I was just gonna say that when you said like uh, Anthony Dupuy, you know this guy was yeah. actually he had a very good tennis for grass. I mean the guy was uh, standing pretty far back using the long prestige, and he he was swinging his backhands and forehands yep. same power as me. Like I, I was surprised uh, I was surprised he didn't have a good run at yeah. at, at Wimbledon himself. Mm. I mean this guy, and I think I had the I I might have played him. Uh, a few times as well so it was uh it was he was a tough opponent to beat and the uh, japanese guys even though I, I think now a few more of them came to the to the higher level into the rankings but there were a few guys at that age at that time who were solid challenger players and uh in their culture they always play in fast course pretty well you know they're very fast very quick staying low mm-hmm. have good reflexes so they're not easy guys a lot of them are not easy guys to beat on grass so uh the good thing is that i knew most of them and i knew what uh, what what's going to be coming but it was just my year, you know. It really was your year, man. That was awesome. Yeah. You know, everybody kind of knows that your nickname was the Vladiator. Uh, tell us about your relationship with that movie, uh, with and and how you might use some of that now as a coach. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, the story was uh, it, it started very easy. I was uh, Im- imagining I'm there standing with my dad already uh, two weeks through the tournament obviously first week you come a few days before you know you 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 go through the qualities then you go through the first week 
And it's not it's not easy, you know. Two weeks in the same place for a tennis player usually it's a week in week wow. out. So and then I'm getting a little bit bored. But then uh, I also kind of like this uh, action movies historical. And I think uh, I saw this advertisement and it was going on around already the movie. So I said, man, I'm gonna catch up. I'm I'm gonna watch this movie. So I went to to watch that movie and the quality of the movie. The, the 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 music there the actor play it was so amazing that i said listen instead of just like staying at home and watching tv i'm gonna k- keep coming and watching this movie again and plus i don't have to listen to my dad every time you know? i love my dad he's, <laughs> he's such a nice guy but it's like yeah. this this uh you know the, the the thing that builds up you know the the the, the feeling that something special is happening and all of a sudden you, you everybody starts feeling like they need to give more advices or they need to chew your ear a little more and then you in contrary you want to kind of calm yourself down and just like uh, keep that keep that thing in you you know it's i felt like it's important so this was my kind of a, a runaway you just sit in a quiet movie theater mm. you go through this emotional stuff and uh, it keeps your inner fire going you know, but then you're also kind of alone, so you're not spitting it out. And then you you coming in, you just take a sip of tea, you go to sleep. Six in the morning, you wake up, you go to do your routines, and you kind of carry that feeling with you. And it was yes, it was a great great feel of a uh, great combination of uh, kind of being ready tennis and physically wise and also maintaining that emotional emotional commitment because. I, I I always felt like, you know, some of the players underachieve in the Grand Slams because mm. after they reach a third round, they say, you know, I've, you know, I put my name on the map and I'm already there, you know, I've made a couple of uh, thousands of dollars. And then, but is that truly the limit? And I felt like, no, this time I'm going to ride the wave until absolutely I can. You know, and that's that's why like the toughest match for me, honestly, was to play Byron Black because mm. uh, uh, because for two things. Uh, first thing I've realized that uh, it's a chance. I mean, playing it's still a little bit, I guess, when you look in a draw, it's easier to see Byron Black than Pete Sampras yeah. or <laughs> Pat Raft or Agassi. So I had I saw it as a chance, just like most for me, same as him actually but uh nevertheless how well he played to get to that quarters i mean he he played great tennis and he played the tennis that actually suits the grass as well yeah he's such a great volleyer exactly exactly he had those short swings and returns you know he was moving he was passing shot well he had i think u.s college background so he had very structured game and so it was on one hand, it was expectations and thinking this is the chance. But on the other hand, it was really solid opponent that you know that if you don't handle yourself in the match well, he's going to break you down. He's mm-hmm. good enough to do that. And to me, this was like a really, really challenging match for my tennis ego because the matches before I felt like I had nothing to lose in many of them, but this match, I do have something to lose. I have a semifinal to lose Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to do that. So this is where I, this was the match where I had to fight all my demons, like uh, psychology wise and maintain the, maintain all the best I could have at that match and kind of leave besides leave uh, leave uh, make sure that nothing bothers me that could kick in this was like the real uh, test for me oh, I, th- I think awesome. byron brack's the only guy that uh uh, has his sister has better volleys than he does. <laughs> Car- Cara Black. <laughs> you seen that? You you've seen that YouTube video of Cara Black? She's like, oh my god! It's like a hundred volleys in like thirty seconds. You're sitting there going, "There's crazy. no way. There is no yeah. way that that you know." Yes. They they were crazy volleyers. Yes, yeah. they, they were. Yeah, They're I think best. wasn't that Newf that uh, Carl Newfeld? I think he was the right. their coach. Yeah, yeah a local guy friend. here in Dallas yeah. who was the SMU tennis coach. I know Carl. Do you know, Carl? know Carl? Yeah. yeah. Yes, of yeah. course. We we chat each other every mm-hmm. every once in a while and. Uh, he actually had one or two Belarusian guys uh, coming to. Oh, uh, to I, w- one of my favorites is Artem Baradach. Yeah. 
Uh, ah, Artem, Artem, amazing guy, good friend, yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And Alex Skripko. Oh, oh Skripko was yep. the other one. Yep. Davis Cup from yes, Belarus. Skripko, Alex Skripko. He's yeah. a good, uh, good friend of mine. He's back in Minsk, uh, running a tennis center. Yeah. Yeah, he's an amazing coach too. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small world. How we how we been connected world. that uh, you know, Vladimir has been a part of our world in yeah. some way, and uh, mm-hmm. we've been a part of his world too. So, well, yes. you know, we just did. Uh, Vlad, thank you. You took yes. us through Davis Cup, Wimbledon and your background uh we kind of already did the second set where uh rick ekloff has just one more question who is the second set brought to us by by the way the second <laughs> set i mean uh, it could be secula sports it's that would a be a new sponsor for us Circula. Yes, secula app the first world-class platform to unite sport and entertainment so Brilliant. check out their their app circula they're actually listed on the uh, logo uh here as we're talking so see our q u l a the great mark wylam yeah we know us. him from the uk and yes. Ireland as well, but now there it's a worldwide thing. It is right yeah. there. So worldwide secure network. network. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the question from one of our great, great uh, fans and friends is uh, his name is Rick Ekloff, and Ekloff, mm-hmm. by the way, loves Sasha Bublik. That's Sasha. That's his favorite player. And uh, mm-hmm. Rick says, "Okay, Vladimir, you as a player, uh, we've talked a little bit about it, but." What are your biggest strengths and how you develop them? I feel like we got that one. Uh, Mm -hmm. The ones, this is very interesting for me also. Rick asks, what are the elements of your game that you would improve if you were playing on the tour now, 20 years later? Mm -hmm. Uh, Right now, I would be, I would be, uh, actually, Actually, I think that I could suit the tour right now better than at that time because really? I felt like my game was stuck in the middle between a typical clay quarter ah. and typical indoor player because I felt like perhaps I was I was not not disciplined but mo- not complete enough to play a very solid indoor game. I mean, when you went indoors at that time on those surfaces, the guys are hitting bombs, 220, 230 coming in. Jeez. And it was still the times of like Ivan Isovich, Kafelnikov, Krychek. Yeah. A lot of the big guys, they really like played so fast. And you were, you felt like they overwhelmed you. It was still a lot of really big and strong guys. And then when, uh, so you felt like you're falling a little bit short to where you can really feel like you're going head mm, to head. Mm. Always it a little bit to catch up. And then when you move back to clay courts, there were guys with legs like this, mm. chased every ball and who spin the ball like crazy. So then the balls, instead of in, in, in an indoors, the balls are coming below your knees. And then on clay courts, the ball are always above your shoulders. And then it's different. It's absolutely different ball game. And where I trained, we 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 did not have a very good clay court culture to go to the culture t- to the clay court tennis or to stick to the indoors because then the hard court started coming in mm-hmm. and this is where i felt like right now hard courts is my best surface mm. i'm still coaching i still like to hit the ball so yeah. i would say that probably uh, my tennis suited better if i played at this era because uh i could still get away with my backhand yeah uh, my forehand is powerful enough mm. and I can mix up my surf pretty well and I can also return better. Mm. And actually that's why at the end of my, towards like the second part of my career, I did quite a few good results on hard courts. Mm. I did well in uh, Doha. Uh, I did well in, uh, even in Rotterdam when they put in that first uh, uh, slower hard courts on, 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 on wood. And uh, when I went to the States, we played those uh, in San Jose and those like typical hard courts. Mm. I felt really good there. But the, uh, so I just say that uh, I would not need to improve much. If I was just born like maybe 10 years later, yeah. I think I would shoot in the game a little bit easier for me. Yeah, this blend, this all-rounder kind of game that you played anyway. Well, Mm -hmm. rounding out the second set um, is two more questions. One from Rick. He says, what are some methods that you like to see in training these days? Uh, Well, let's say uh, what I like to see, 
what I miss, and uh, w- I think one of the reasons I succeeded as a coach back in Belarus is that actually, eventually, we, you know, we just started uh, to study tennis, not just okay, let's hit these crosses or down the lines. Mm-hmm. Eventually, after doing all the usual stuff, I said, guys, we need some stat people, and we need to study what is the model of the of the of the modern tennis how actually what is statistically how many serves the guys hit how many returns they do how many shots what are the main patterns uh what are the consequences and then we structured the system where we started working on specific patterns and uh, doing very certain things and literally half a year later gerasimov took off he went from i don't know to 250 we got him going up pretty fast. This is uh, Igor Gerasimov? Exactly. And then Ivashka, you know, Ivashka picked up and then got picked up by the Spanish and then, uh, and, 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 and some of the juniors, you know, and then we took all this approach to also working with the, with the Fed Cup because every team we played, including us, when we played finals at the, at the ITF, we, we had on every player, we actually had like a book, uh, what what he likes to do at what score mostly he's going to do. Interesting. Uh, what are what, what are his patterns that he's using? Why he's using that? I mean, I could tell it. Okay, if you keep this girl in the point longer than six seconds, there is like this percent that you're going to win the rally. So breaking the breaking the big picture into small details that are manageable and mm. easy to explain to your player. And then, of course, that's the easy part. And then the tough part is actually to constructing the the training procedure where you're working on specific stuff. Because mm. I see too much, personally, I see too much of generalization. There's a lot of guys just walking around, hitting a lot of tennis balls and talking about general stuff and then waiting for the talented guys to to go through anyway. I mean, this happens quite a lot. And then, so this is about professional tennis. And, yeah. uh, and it's, uh, to me, it was, uh, to me, it was a great little sign when I was with one, one of the juniors from Belarus at the French, and we were in a player lounge. And then it was like a few chairs. And then behind us was a little bit a lounge. So Roger was there with Ivan Lubicic. Uh-huh. And then um, I, I heard that they were discussing, okay, at this score, there is a, this percentage that he's going to serve there. And then they, they keep going through that stuff. So I'm like thinking to myself, you know, I'm doing the right stuff with all those guys, with all those teams, because this is what the number ones do. Yeah. So this was, a, this was a good confirmation of kind of like the direction where it had to be. And then the second part, uh, considering junior tennis, I just feel like, the, how how everything is organized in in, in junior tennis is uh, is uh, there's a lot of kind of error already in the beginning because tennis uh, is a very difficult coordinate uh, it's a it's a tough coordinated sport mm-hmm. you know it, it's it, it's very it, it's difficult it's not like in in let's say where you're just trying or just like tossing the ball yeah. tennis is tough. I mean, you're going to hit the balls from all the different. So actually, before going into tennis technique, I think kids need to first develop enough physically. And then there's also had to be a lot of lead up exercises before technique, because this is how our system works. This is how mere fascia is, is working. You need to create those, uh, those uh, kind of like... A, those myofascial connections, yeah? Exactly. You need yeah. to create those. And then it's the tennis technique is easier to is easier to, to fix, and then it's easier to stay there. Mm. And this is the reason why at the Grand Slams, I mean, I always, when I was at the Grand Slams or bigger tournaments, I took younger guys. Okay, we watched some matches, but I said, listen, listen, watch what they do in the practice. Watch how they warm up. You know, this is this is the things that are not on the TV, but this is why they become the greats. And then you see Roger, Rafa, Novak, all these guys, like half an hour before the training, last 15 minutes, they're always doing some uh, technique-related exercises. And eventually you understand by science why they do that. 
you know, they're uh, presetting all those myofascial connections. Mm -hmm. It's easy. And I think that you should use the same approach when the kids are coming in and then uh, to, before giving a tennis racket, there are certain stages a kid has to go through mm. because then he's going to catch the technique a lot faster and, and easier, you know, because if you just in the first practice, you give him a tennis racket, do like this for him. It's like, if you tell him like a hit of football, nothing is created yet. So you need to lead the guy, lead the tennis kid up to the tennis technique and then, okay, you're going to spend first a couple of months more, but then he's going to start catching up so fast, mm -hmm. amazingly, you know, because for the kids, it's a lot easier to control what his just hand is doing or then with a tennis ball or then with a light subject yeah. and so on, so on before he actually grabs a tennis racket. But once he does, he's, 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 he's putting in a perfect technique. You know, so this this I don't see much. And how the tennis right now you you're watching a typical first tennis lesson, you know, the, because the parents obviously they have no idea. They come on the court, okay. I see a tennis basket. Yeah. Here's the racket. This is what you do. Boom, boom. You toss the kid the ball, uh, kid to the tennis. Boom. Oh, you see, he's playing already. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Give me five. <laughs> and then it goes on for the next five, six years, uh. and then he's going to play at eleven, twelve, and then like you know, why is my kid not playing tennis? Because, well, you know, five years later, he's doing the same exercises only from a different part of court. Oh, no. Hey, it sounds like you are v very adept at taking very specific things uh, through analytics and then mm -hmm. using those to make practice more like real tennis, like professional tennis. What are some of the tools, the analytics? Is it tennis analytics? Is it uh, data from the mm -hmm. IBM Watson, or is it from something like how Craig O'Shaughnessy is able to mm -hmm. um, tag matches? How do mm -hmm. you do it? So we have this company. Well, we have this company. I don't know if they're still operating, hopefully. So uh, uh, they are, they're called Tennis Comstat, uh -huh. Tennis Comstat. And uh, the, their background is that they did the, they did the software for, one of, as I understand, they did a software for uh, FIFA uh, for analyzing the ball movement around the court, uh -huh. and then eventually they adapted it to tennis. So uh, we sat down with them, and I said, guys, uh, let's see what we can do together. And they actually did a good job. We, did the, we had a lot of meeting back and forth. And we kind of, uh, together, of course, they did most, like at least half of the stuff, the way they did it first, but then uh, through going through every Davis Cup match and putting more and more data through the system, uh, they also picked up some of the most important patterns, and uh, this is how they uh, this is how we work. So I, when I'm saying, let's say in, in in let's say when we played against USA in the finals of Fed Cup, mm -hmm. I knew what are the patterns of uh, Sloan Stevens mm -hmm. or what uh, Coco van der Wege at which serve, at which score she's going to serve most likely. And then, you know, when you have three weeks for the prepare and then you have uh, three, four hitting partners for the girls, mm -hmm. it's easier to construct the tennis process to prepare the specifics, you know, and uh, it's actually, you know, all this stuff is easy, organizable. If you first have a vision, what you do with it and you have the tools, and actually, at the end, uh, uh, before I could not take it anymore, back at home working with that system, uh -huh. I uh, my 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 logo was every time we came to the Ministry of Sports or every time we had to go to get some funding, I said, listen, we know how to win, not with the mighty names, but with the brain. I so see. give us support, give me support, and I will bring you wins. And this is what we did. You know, the girls, the, the year where they went to the finals of Fed Cup, Vika did not play one match. She was part of the team to go from those relegation matches somewhere. But then it, it was these young girls who beat a lot of players with the names. Uh -huh. And then, uh, of course, uh, the Davis Cup team, you know, going from all the way from, from, from back from back door somewhere, we went actually to the playoff to the world group without having a one top hundred player. We we were supposed to go to play Switzerland 
and uh, Gerasimov and Ivashka, they were not top 100 yet, but they were so good at that season that we had all the chances to get to the world group and be a team without a 100 player to be in the world group. So okay. that, that I called success, at least for myself, is that when, you're, uh, when, you, when you know what you have, when you know who you have to beat, and you understand the tools, how to do it. And this is this is my approach in coaching. And uh, uh, I think a lot of that comes from being very responsible. Uh, and I think I'm thankful to, uh, to, to the team that I actually got on a tour in the first place, yeah. working with Maria and, uh, and Maria and uh, Thomas Hoxett working in that team. Mm -hmm. You understand the importance of being basically extremely professional and you have to answer for every word you say. So, you know, at that level, there are no mistakes. You know, you know you're, right? you're backing up all your coaching with real answers, evidence-based data. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And th that's just, that's just uh, my approach. And I quite honestly don't understand how it can be done the other way. You know, we see it all the time when coaches seem to wing it or they make stuff up and, you know, sometimes the, the player believes it, but mm -hmm. the way you're doing it is really, really wonderful. Hey, speaking of tools, Craig, there's a great question from Nick Smith as we round out the set. Yep. Uh, and he's talking about, go ahead, why don't you... Uh, oh, you can go ahead. Yeah, just... Uh, I was, okay. Let me... Let me he's, oh, of course, course yeah. Quick. Vladimir, how do you feel, how do you feel that the string, that's a different side of the tools, uh, he follows up by asking... Does Vladimir feel that the current string today would make a difference or would have made a difference in your game 20 years ago? Or did you use poly and poly? Or did you use gut and poly? What did you use? Uh, I used, uh, I used uh, mostly... Uh, Kirschbaum, your, right? Uh, Kirschbaum. Yeah. At the Wimbledon, I used Kirschbaum, but they came, they came in not with the yellow string that uh, eventually killed everybody's uh, uh, elbow, elbow or shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, they came up with a string called, called the Touch Titanium, and it was uh, very soft. It was synthetic, but very soft string uh -huh. that actually could uh, resist because I played with a very high tension that Wimbledon. It was around like 28 or 30 kilos. But, th but the string, because of its uh, elasticity, it felt so good that you could get the best of both worlds. You know, you, you, the ball sit on the racket well, but then it took off pretty well uh, uh, too, because the yellow string was like you could not miss a ball, but you could not also like a hit a winner. The ball just did not go behind the, you know. But but that string was very good. And then of course we know how uh, Luxilon, uh, Luxilon, and those strings uh, changed the game quite a lot. But uh, and of course uh, I also had a period in my life, almost two years, where, where I went. Uh, got got on the main and then poly on the crosses and mixing all those up and uh, some of the tournaments I benefited from it a lot and then what I did was for me the feeling was like if I use just gut after two or three weeks I felt like I'm losing the contact point yeah. because the string is so soft it's easy to play the volley the slice it's easy to serve but then eventually because the contact is so soft you're losing the the, the feel like when you're really like slapping through the ball, as soon as I felt like I'm starting missing too much, I would go back to synthetic. I would put that, get my hitting point back, like get the feel like I'm contacting the ball well, yeah. uh, ball well, and then again mix it up or go for 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 gut for one or two weeks. And at that time, I have to say that it was almost inevitable to use gut every once in a while because guys uh, played so fast you know mm -hmm. you, you would play some serving volleyers or you know it, it just gives you an advantage but then eventually also the weight of the rackets as you know like uh, how the industry changed the weight of the racket started going down yeah. so you hurt yourself a lot less so then the, the, the faster string came in and of course uh uh, I always used to say that uh, like this technological revolution that happened in tennis, yeah. 
it gave the chance to a lot of the smaller guys because of the lighter racket frames to generate the arm um, faster. Yeah, the racket fast speed. Ring, yeah. But they did not build the shoes for the bigger guys to move faster. Uh-huh. You know, you have to even it out because basically by, uh, you know, uh, before when you had the guys with the rackets 380, 390, they would just come out and serve a lot of bumps and finish with the forehand. And then the other guys with those weights of the rackets, it was tough to manage that racket at those speeds. So then they took the weight of the rackets down. So it was easier to manage these hard and heavy balls. But then the bigger guys, you know, they did not put on the shoes that would make them move fast yeah. <laughs> to compensate. And that's that's actually that's actually one of the reasons why I think uh, the game changed to a lot of this a lot of this more towards baseline and a lot of rallying from the baseline to the extent where right now I'm just, my hopes are with guys like Seth Korda and uh, let's say Tsitsipas. I want these younger guys to learn faster, to do better from inside of the court and come in and finish more. I mean, I'm already exhausted watching <laughs> unbelievable baseline tennis of Rublev yeah. and uh I think the guy just wants to kill everybody from the baseline. Yeah. And if he just like watched Safin when he won uh, his second Australian Open, the only reason he won that one and he beat Roger on the way is because he just came in more. Yeah, he came in a and, lot. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. And actually, and actually, at that level with the guys of that talent, you know, it doesn't. You don't need to be a super volleyer. After those kinds of forehands. Just wait for your chance, come in a little more, and it's not just the value, you make it or you don't. Actually, people start understanding that they're being under constant pressure. Mm. You know, they, they're going to start making more mistakes. So I think all this this young, a lot of these young guys, I think that what, what happens is a lot of them are exploring their talent, and that talent is good enough to take it, to take them, most of them, a lot of them to top 20, top 10, but why they cannot be the top three guys is because it takes another level of intellect in the game and ability to read the game a little bit better, you know, so they kind of get stuck. And I, I'm, my hopes are with guys like, because I think Tsitsipas has that game. I think, uh, I think uh, I like where Ogier Aliasin is moving now, yeah. especially with his indoor win this year. Yeah. I like while well, he was being aggressive coming in. And then I really love, I think this guy, even though everybody's talking about Alcaraz now, but I really like this guy, Seb Korda. Love, I think love he's going to be a great yeah. player. I think he's going to be a great player. He's like a giant in an ambush still, but I think he's going to come out. And then, uh, of course, I, I don't know why, but I feel like Denis Shapovalov eventually is, is going to have his, uh, he's going to have his, uh, something come together because how beautiful his game is. He is so fun to watch. You know, you, you love Becker so much. He reminds me of how Becker would play. He'd take chances. Exactly. He, sometimes he can break a guy with three or four great returns too. He's not just exactly. a come in and attack guy. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He can, he can do everything. I just want him to get his attitude and his mind, you know, not complaining about little things. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see that, too. I'm with you. I think we have, you know, kind of similar tastes. Um, Craig, any other questions from the crew? No, I think you know, he yeah. answered the second part Excellent. of Nick's, Nick's question you yeah. know, about rackets and yeah, you know, uh, that was kind of a follow up right there, but I think he, he did a good job. You, you touched on Wimbledon, and we're definitely yeah. going to get to that in the fourth set. Craig, you got anything for the third? Who's the sponsor? Uh, that'd be Topo Chico. Topo Chico. So we're, we're having our official drink of the. Uh, I don't know if uh, yeah, Vladimir. You know, we'll, we'll uh, toast you right there. Cheers, buddy. You're right there with the right. Topo Chico. Have a break. You, have right. a sip. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, we're yes, talking yes. so much. It's good to drink a bit. And. Yep. Uh, mm. Third set, Vladimir, it's all about your current projects and future projects. Uh, before the show, we were talking about how awesome it is that you're in Turkey. You're in the mm-hmm. big city, and it's very entrepreneurial. Tell us about mm-hmm. your current projects as a coach and mm-hmm. your future projects uh, coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right now, I am. Uh, I have just uh, literally a month ago finished uh, 
uh, on tour coaching with uh, one of the one of the guys from Estonia. Uh -huh. uh, but we're still in touch. So every once in a while, he'll be coming back to Turkey to have a few training weeks. Okay. And right now, I'm, I'm uh, working on a academy type uh, project where I can set up a base and uh, and uh, yeah, basically academy type uh, training facility. I'm talking to a few hotels, and we're perhaps we're getting uh, uh, close to the close to the point where uh, it's going to be possible to start something. Because as I said, as I said before, uh, when I came here the first time, I was amazed by the opportunity. There are so many good hotels with a lot of tennis courts, and basically with the grass growing from them. So it's a lot of unused. Opportunity opportunities so i was uh, i was lucky to speak to a few of the uh hotel managers and uh, trying to explain our vision that we can combine both if we if we can get like a good hospitality rates for the players to come to stay in and then uh you know uh, pick up a few courts nearby the hotel and and there you go because uh, i have a, a pretty good team i've obviously re remained all the contacts from the times where i worked uh, back in uh, federation and in, in belarus and obviously i know a lot of people in tennis world so i feel like right now i'm uh, ready to share my knowledge in that kind of a project mm -hmm. and uh, i'm in the middle of kind of uh, the the final stage and uh, I'm also feeling like I'm in the right place to be right now because Turkey is very open. Uh, it's a very beautiful country. It's very entrepreneurial. Uh, of course, you need to kind of, uh, it, it takes a while sometimes to explain your vision. Like in the States, people in general are very fast and quick to pick up. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'll keep moving. And uh, I feel like I'm mostly i'm uh, done with the uh, touring projects like one on one mm -hmm. uh, because also the family is important you know yeah. there is a time in your life where you say you know all this thing is good but uh, the kids are growing up my uh, rodion is 11 darina is 7 and this is the time where i want to start giving them back also my knowledge and uh, and uh, spending more time with them because I think it's uh, a huge part of men's life, the, f the family part. To be a father and a husband, yeah. Hey, so two kids, boy and a girl. Yes. Uh, actually, I have uh, one more daughter. I have uh, one more daughter from my first marriage, uh -huh. uh, Yaroslava, but she lives with her mom back in uh, Belarus and Minsk and in Minsk and Moscow sometimes. Yeah. But these three, you know, I'm uh, yeah, it's th the time has come to kind of uh, create something where they can be a part of. That's important. And uh, depending, on how, depending on how this is going to go, we either, you know, if it works well, we, we get to the level um you know we, we we either multiply or uh i'm looking towards uh i'm looking towards eventually somehow you know when i was 15 16 and i spent so much time in the states and i kept coming back uh as a tour player and then uh, of course being a part of maria's team uh, hanging out around la and then uh, i worked with uh, isla tomlianovic last year for mm. almost like five, five months we trained back in walk back in boca every time i go to us i feel almost like at home yeah. i swear to god like, everything yeah. is so easy to understand and uh, a lot of a lot of contacts there I worked with one of the Chinese uh, kids when I worked uh, also two, three years ago by the, back at the IMG Academy. So uh, it's it's as as interesting as it is, but um, I think eventually I'm going to end up in the States. <laughs> yeah, no. And I actually, I think I'm going to enjoy it because I just like the... The more I mature as a as a as a human being, I feel <clears throat> I feel this is the country where uh, you know we, where you can make things happen. I'll see where it takes. I'll see how it goes. But uh, this is kind of like the plan. Awesome plan and great projects you have, uh, CB. Let's go. Or anything else in current future projects? <clears throat> Any other questions? Should no, we go? No. Let's go fourth set. Uh, Who's this brought to us by? Vantaggio Boys. Vantaggio. This is an apparel company. It sounds so Italian, uh, and it mm -hmm. is, but they're based here in Texas. And I mm -hmm. love the Vantaggio uh, logo. You didn't wear um, your wristband. I didn't wear it, but uh, every time you see it, you realize, okay, uh, the orangey red from the clay, the green from the grass, 
the blue from the hardcore. It's it's just beautiful. The yeah. rainbow colors and uh, there's a lot of texture. It's, it's that thing that tennis texture. has. You texture. know, texture. texture. All the texture. other sports don't have four <laughs> surfaces, and uh, for that reason, I love that company. Right. So fourth set, Vladimir. I got to put you mm-hmm. on the spot. Tell us mm-hmm. about your thoughts as a man from mm-hmm. originally USSR. Um, mm-hmm. until I think USSR existed until you were about 11 or maybe mm-hmm. 12 years old. Um, mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on the Russia and Belarus band from Wimbledon? Um, mm-hmm. How how are some of your friends dealing with it, and how do you feel about it? Uh, I think uh, I'll start first with saying that I, I confront war. That's like the baseline, the bottom line. Good. I think yeah. the world we live in, in the 21st century, with so much uh, social media and everybody knows uh, everybody, I think not just for that reason, but just uh, war as a tool of getting what you want or getting the things dull, for me as a human being, is unacceptable. Uh that's that that that's one thing. Uh, sport, I think, throughout many years and different situa- situations, was a tool to unite. It was a it was a Olympic Games, like the symbol of Olympic Games. Throughout many years, they said when the Olympic Games are on, all the wars have to stop. And this is how I see. This is how I see the sport. Mm. It has to keep going with that tradition. Trust me when I say that all those guys from Russia or from Belarus, there is nothing behind besides talking about it. They can really do to stop it. Mm. They're not gonna talk to those generals. They're not gonna talk to those presidents. We, we just don't do that. You you can have your opinion. You can say that. And this, and a lot of these guys, they go out and say, Rublev says, guys, let us play. We will give all the prize money to the, to the guys who are suffering. Mm. You know, so there's, there is sense in what they're, and the idea that, you know, let us do what we do. Let not that something bad become part of our world. Most of these guys, they live and train in the Western world anyway. They have their moms and dads just I, just as I do. Normal human being mm. cannot take and cannot look those images when people are dying, when kids are dying. You just you, you, you cannot take it. The and, and then the, all the other stuff comes. What can you physically do? Mm. You know. And I understand all of those Ukrainian guys who are extremely upset about position of those Russians. They, 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 they you know, the, when they're fighting for the to to ban to from competition. And uh, I understand as a human being because their compatriots are dying, their kids, and this. But the reality is, these guys from Belarus, from Russia, nothing is in their hands. Mm. Nothing is in their hands. Look around. I mean, have you seen what happened in Belarus in 2020? Like a quarter of a million people came on the street for a certain reason. And then uh, what followed the next year? You know, a lot of the people go to go get get some uh, some penalties, get some uh, get some get fired from the work. They, uh, you know, some of them go to jail for saying some things. And then, uh, so w- what's the point? You want a few more of, of professional athletes to go to the jail. You want their families to have problems. This is not going to solve. Banning these guys from Wimbledon is not going to solve the war. It can get attention, but there is different ways of attention. Mm. You know, you can, you can, you, you could, you could put in uh, some event during the tournaments, like pro peace event, mm-hmm. where all these guys come together. I don't know, but to me, my personal position, I, I don't go contra. I support what is constructive. So this is this this is kind of uh, this is kind of like uh, my idea. And another thought on this is that 
I think it's easy, and I'm I'm kind of a little bit disappointed with uh, how the world is going in. It's people are very often, it's almost like created that you always have to take one side or the other. But the world we live in, the gray area in the middle is overwhelming. I have my background. I can accept this and that and that, but I cannot accept that, Mm. you know, and they just say, and, and basically to understand, to go in depth, you need to think, you need to be pretty intellectual. And it's almost like, don't think, just say you go left or right. And I don't like that approach. I'm with you. There's uh, there's such a premium on here. In the next half hour, we're going to tell you what to think. And we don't trust you to do any critical thinking of your own. And uh, right. it's not complex. But really, yeah. man, it's pretty complex. And let us have our uh, let us have our research, you know. All right. Yeah. Oh, terrible. Terrible. So thank you for that. Uh, Um, very passionate and also sensitive view of the Mm -hmm. situation in in, in Wimbledon and the world. And speaking of Wimbledon, you mentioned Felix Auger Aliassime. You mentioned Mm -hmm. the attacking tennis of Seb Korda and Stefano Tsitsipas. Who Mm -hmm. are some other players? And feel free to talk about the women also who are in the draw, who you'd like to see succeed at uh, Mm -hmm. Wimbledon this next two weeks. Well, um, uh, I'm. Um, I think I think uh, Hurkacz is a is a guy who is that game. I really like he, how he plays. Like I said, I think Denis Shapovalov yeah. has uh, has has a good game. Of course, all these names are coming after Rafa and Djokovic because yeah. these guys are not gonna go easy. Mm-hmm. They're not gonna just like walk away. You know, they're gonna fight like like super. But actually, grass is the surface to beat both of them. I think yes. in my in my personal. And then, of course, when I'm saying this younger guys, it's not because I don't take in consideration guys like John Isner or Apelka oh. and a few of these big hitters. But but I'm really looking into this. Uh, younger generation. And the reason why I didn't say, let's say, Zverev is because I think he was he started moving that direction, moving closer to the net when he got to the finals and they played, the, uh, and they played team in, uh, in US, US Open. Open. Yeah, exactly. I think he was, he was, he probably listened to his uh, older brother, Misha, and yeah. he came in a lot more and he became more dangerous. But then for some reason, he got stuck a little bit too much behind the baseline as well. So in general, boys, let's say men or women, I like to see a complete game. And I think one of the keys why Roger was successful is that uh, he could play all the tools and he let the game uh, open up as the point goes in. And if you get a shorter ball, you come in. You get a deep ball, you need to defend, you defend. When you hit the out wide serve, when you put the opponent on a stretch, he's going to come in. Oh. So to me, I don't look at the players as younger, older, name, non name. I look at the player and I try to see where is there logic? Is there a game logic in what he's doing? Second, is he disciplined? enough you know if he can he hold himself together and not break down in a tough situation mm. and then the third i want to see how physically prepared and how physically mat- maturing he is so to me this three things are most important this is what i want to see in the pledge and the reason why i said i like sep corder a lot is that i think like he got what it takes he has a good technique yeah he can for him it's easy to come in he 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 has the game for that but i also like how he holds himself on the court how he carries himself on the court so he's he's not showing too much so it means that a lot going on thinking a lot going on disciplining himself mm. and i like this type of players i like i want to see passion on the court but i want to see i also want to see structure on the court i want to see a winning structure on the court that's the thing. Uh, to back up my point, if you've seen uh, Novak, how he tried to adapt 
at the Australian, at the, was it uh, US Open last year when he lost to Medvedev? That's right. How he saw that the only chance for him, because Medvedev was playing so good, it was unbelievable. The chance for him to beat him was to be a more aggressive player. Mm -hmm. And he needed to attack. He needed to take the ball a little bit earlier. But you cannot come become all of a sudden a super aggressive player in just one match. You need to construct your game consistently and move towards that direction. So what I'm saying is that I see that these guys, they understand what it takes. And after it's just a commitment. Do I want to move that way? Mm. To me, I think if Novak took it half a step further in being a little bit more aggressive, I don't know how to beat him, quite honestly, because he had the good hands to play from the middle of the court. You know, he has good, good sense of timing. And uh, I think this, to me personally, this is the part of the game that is missing in men's tennis in a lot of the guys. I mean, can you imagine with Rublev's forehand and backhand, this guy stepping one and a half meters inside and after one of those backhands, he come in. Okay, he's going to miss a few volleys. Yeah. But eventually he's going to start making them. He's going to keep the rallies shorter. The guys are going to feel, start feeling a real pressure from his powerful tennis. You know, it's, it's, it's a different ball game. I think right now there are so many younger guys with huge talent and underachieving for this specific reason. Vladimir, it's almost like you're describing um, a, a hybrid player like yourself and almost a younger, faster Roger. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, I think so. I think so. And I think uh, that's, that's why Roger was so successful. The like best. my first impression when I saw him play was in Challenger in Brest in France. Everyone said, well, oh, this guy is going to be super great. I'm yeah. like, I'm looking at this guy and he's not, he's not doing anything special, but he's doing the right thing. You know, he gets a shorter ball, boom, chip and charge, come in. He gets a shorter ball above, boom, step in, come in. So there was, there was constant logic in what he does on the tennis court. And then when you back that up with that talent, mm. you know, every, it's, it's like a key that opens all the doors while the, all the other guys are still stuck with just their strong parts and the weak parts. Mm. And this guy built up his game where you could almost not attack his backhand. His forehand was a world level, good serve, unbelievable touch, but it's the understanding of the game. If he could win, if he can win a point in three shots, he's going to win it in three shots. Mm. If he can win in five, he's going to win it in five. He's not going to hit the shots that he doesn't need to hit. That's why I personally, I personally, emotionally, I also loved Andrew Agassi. Like how the guy was on the court, he was leaving. I just love how he played, like hard hitting and emotionally. Like when I look at Andrew, I feel like, man, this guy is like, I want him to be my brother. Yeah. Really, it's like <laughs> unbelievable. But then on a tennis part, I understand that if you take eight slams of Agassi uh, and eight slams of tennis, uh, Pete has won out of those eight slams, probably having to feed two times less shots. So then we go to effectiveness. You know, if you can win those eight slams, having to feed two times less probably shots, it's not that you don't even compare it different styles. But at the end of the game, if you build a structure and you spend half a million dollar or a million dollar, it's not that you don't know how to, you know how to do it, but obviously it's the guy who invested less, he's a better thinker. And that's kind of like my approach towards the game. I want to see, I want to see this logic. Okay, you're 18, you're 19, you can hit a, you can hit a forehand like unbelievable. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. You show that when you're 18. Show us where you have improved at 22. Are you sti he still hitting that 
super forward, okay, but we've seen that four years already. Why are you not winning slams? Mm. You know, so to me, I'm almost like it's because I was in a position back in Belarus where we had to beat big teams. I had to figure out how to beat the Giants. So you have to capitalize. You have to find and press that button to win the match. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. So this critical thinking, this analytical, is like every time I see a player, I want to see that completion. I want to see that perfect picture. Yeah. So, and and this is how, and sometimes I feel like maybe I'm being too, like I, sometimes I commented on Facebook or Instagram mm -hmm. about uh, some of the Russian players and maybe it didn't go that well, but mm -hmm. it was not to criticize a person. It was just to see that you can do so much more if, you're be if your game becomes more complete. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why kind of the approach to the game I like in the Western world better is because I think like in US, you guys have a lot of technology and you study the game so much more and you, you're actually able to reach to so many more tools and uh, perhaps it costs more also to play. Of course, I understand that. But there is a lot of things that you can implement and uh, and, and, and build the player. And uh, uh, I guess the tour needs uh, more, more, more coaches who are also like kind of a little more into theory also and understanding. Like to me, when I'm watching Grand Slams and I'm listening and commentating from John McEnroe, Mats Vilander, for, from all those Tim Hanman, from all those Boris Becker, John McEnroe, to me, it's always a school because I either support my ideas, I listen to what they say, you know, I say, ah, oh, that's right. So I'm always constantly learning. And yeah. this is what I want also some of these younger guys to do the same because you have this greats commentating your match saying, okay, would you come in on this situation now? Do you think, you know, he should be more, they're talking all about this, but it's either the egos of the players or something else. They just stick to something that, you know, they're used to. They're used to. And maybe a producer is in their ear telling them, Hey, this is what the fans want, which is of course why I want Vladimir Volchkov to be a coach and commentator, hopefully here in the States. Speaking of here in the States, Craig, you've got a very interesting question from a high, high level coach here in the States. We are of course American and we love that you mentioned Andre and Pete and uh, a, lot, a lot of the Seb Korda, for example. What's the mm -hmm. question from uh, Pai Sun Yen Chai? Uh, he, he has a question for, for Vlad. Uh, I'd like to see if he thinks any American men have a decent chance at going deep in the singles draw at the Fortnite this year. What are your thoughts on American tennis? Um, and this is specifically think, men. Men, yes. I think, I think, I think, I think uh, Opelka can be extremely dangerous, uh, but Again, you need, you need, uh, you know, winning a grand slam, it takes a certain caliber of a person. You know, all those guys who are winning grand slams, they started winning at extremely high levels very early. Uh, so, you, you, to me, a, a next uh, American winning a Grand Slam is going to be someone who is up up at 18, 19, 20, already playing a top 10. Mm. And uh, this th this is what happened with all the American greats. Agassi, Sampras, uh, Chang. Yeah, Chang. Uh, Rodik. All these guys that really technically won slams, they get to top 10, top 20 very early. At 19, it 18. Take, it, take, it, takes, it takes maturation. When you get at 19, 20 to top, let's say, top of the game, mm. it means that you have the game for it and you have physicality for it because tennis is extremely demanding. But then it also takes your mental maturation because when you're 18, 19 and you're already playing your heroes, First of all, you're just happy to be here. So this is going through your head first two, three years, you know? And this is actually where I think these guys like Tsitsipas, all these 
Aliasim and then Shapovalov and a, a few of these guys, this is where they get stuck. They got early enough to the top, but then, uh, oh, I'm among the greats. But they never broke through. They, they, they did not take the slams, uh, uh, excluding Tim and Medvedev. Mm-hmm. And I think why these guys did is they did took it to the extreme. Tim and I think Medvedev decided that I'm going to have it as my personal challenge mm. to beat these top three guys. So mentally, they took it to the next level. For them, it, at a certain point, for Tim and Medvedev, they said, it's not good enough anymore for me to be in the semifinal or a final. I want to win that. And that commitment, that super commitment, it's almost like if I'm not winning this, I feel myself less lesser man. It's to that extent. So I think this is uh so I think you need that caliber of a person to win a slam. So if you look at the if you look now at some of these younger Americans, mm. you need to look for that type of character. You need to look for someone who is at the top of the game already at 1920 who is already knocking at the semifinals of the slams. And then, you know, after two or three years, boom, he's going to break through because you, you need some time to adapt in some miracles like Raducano or Andreescu. It does happen where they just fly in. That's another interesting topic. How can someone like in, in one week or like me just cut, cut through the game. But in general, in men's tennis is so competitive and so physical that it needs uh, a certain caliber of people to win those slams, you know. And I can see, I can see Opelka, I can see, I can see these guys have great runs. But winning the Grand Slam, uh, I don't know. That's if you remember, Rodik came in also very early. I mean, he was like, wow. So. And and then and then and then even if you look at the, another great uh, like Marty Fish, he was always a good good player, and he matured towards towards the end of the career. He played unbelievable, smart game, very good game. But he was a little bit later. He did not come as fast as Rodik, you know. So and 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 eventually, Andy is a Grand Slam champion, and Marty is a great player, but. A little bit, n- not on that, you know, because I don't know how it works, but it just the way it is. It just if you observe the Grand Slam winners, this this is the caliber. This is how they go. Uh, maybe twelve years ago, or even more, I was back in back in Belarus and I was doing this report, uh, getting ready for the Olympics, and uh, <clears throat> I actually studied for myself to see how many months how many weeks it takes a certain player to get from first tournament to top 100 and then to top 50, to top 20, to top 10. So there you picked up some patterns. And eventually it's different groups, how the people move to the top and where they end up after. So it, it's not... It's not like I'm smart. I'm just observing, and I see that there are certain tendencies and there are certain things that happen on the way for a reason. And if you think you want to be a top 10 player, then you kind of have to mature with a certain speed. If you're falling out of out of that graph, it means there are some parts of your game essential that are missing. You know, so it's, 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 um, this, this is, uh, this is how I'm looking at it. And I honestly think that there's, I like this guy, Brendan Nakashima. Oh yeah. Yeah. From San Diego. I like this guy. I saw him, he played against one of my uh, younger players back in, uh, back at the, at, I think at some of the junior tournaments on grass, actually like three, three years ago. And, uh, he looks like he, he's got the size. And I also like how he's staying, even though he's very open, but he's also quite, he's not making too loud splashes yet, but he's really constructing the game. I think he's getting 
his approach is they're building the team who take him to the top. That's important. That's important because at 19, your heart, you want to be there, but you don't know yet what it takes you. So you must have people who have been there and understand the commitment, discipline, dedication, and have the knowledge who will take you through the tools to get there. And I kind of like how he's, how, I don't know who's behind him, but it's kind of, you know, he's getting already like a good fitness guy in there. And then, uh, it's a good fitness guy. And the Garcia brothers are both involved. Uh, Jaime and mm -hmm. uh, Javier, uh, Pulgar Garcia. They're from Spain originally. And, yeah. uh, they are both, uh, co collaborating with him and Mackie McDonald. I was right directly behind him on a practice court here in Dallas. And he has your kind of two hander, by the way, it's, it can be spin, but it can, he also flattens it and it looks like he's a little open. He's going to be late, but mm -hmm. flat and unbelievable down the line or, uh, cross court with the spin. He's an impressive kid. I'm happy you mentioned him as a American yeah, hopeful. Yeah. 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 Uh, just a second. I need to plug in my computer. Oh, oh thank you. Yeah, please uh, do. And that yeah. gives us a moment, actually, yeah. to transition yeah. into the fifth set. Craig just, Bell. First of all, anything else in the fourth? Uh, no, that was, that was, Python had some other questions. Perfect. But, uh, we're, getting, Perfect. we're getting close in on the Love two it. hour let's mark. Head, <laughs> let's head to the fifth set. Craig, who is the fifth sponsored by? The fifth set is always sponsored by our good friend, Blair desk great with master systems he Love it. he is the uh, official sponsor of our caps uh, yeah yeah we're going to get some new ones out and uh, we're going to get vlad a, a nice uh, nice hat yeah we got to send him things. all the way in oh, turkey yeah. yeah so master mm. systems sponsoring the third uh, the fifth set tonight and that's right normally the third set and if i can just throw a plug in yep. you have a few more hours if you're able to watch this live to hope uh let's let's say the tennis channel yes we, we want you to go to their website and do the racket bracket yes and and uh, on our Facebook and Instagram, you can find the code to get into the Athenet Podcast League. And the winner of that gets a little swag from us, yep. Master Systems, basically, yep. and Vantaggio Tennis as well. That's right. Yep. So good. So fifth set time, Craig yes. Bell. All right. Let's have some fun. Vladimir, you've taken us through such perspective and insight. And me, I know, uh, and our fans, too, we love how you said, I'm not smart. I thought, you know what? You are so smart. Right. And and your um, your perspective or your insight, I believe for me at least, it it takes this amazingly perfectly blend, perfect blend of scientific and analytical, but also philosophical. And I appreciate this so much. And that said, let's uh, relax and smile and enjoy a, first, uh, a fun fifth set here. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's do it. All right. So uh, I, I assume you like music, Vladimir. You, are you a music guy? I I am a, I am a music guy uh, uh, and uh, I think I've sent you some of the stuff mm -hmm. that I like to listen to. Right. I'm a music guy and uh, I listen both to uh, Western world music a lot because obviously I speak English and uh, some of the some of the Russian music. But I like uh, yeah I'm absolutely a music guy. Who's your favorite band? So, so from a, uh, maybe from your your country standpoint, then also maybe you know like a Western band. Uh, so l let's start with the Western because okay. I've been actually, we've been, uh, driving, uh, recently from, uh, all the way South Turkey back to Istanbul. It took us like seven hours and oh, wow. we went through a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the rock. I like rock quite a lot. And, uh, I like Ben Howard a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that that type of music, I like uh, things like, uh, depth over distance and then uh, uh the wolves uh, that 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 part and then uh i like uh, bon iver uh quite a lot yeah i think he had a few great albums and uh <clears throat> groups like uh everlast uh for example i used to listen to when i was a little bit younger and then uh i actually like classic rocks quite a lot i think uh uh it's almost like um they used to be, if you look at the time, even of the compositions from classic rocks like Led Zeppelin and then Guns N' Roses and, uh, and the Scorpions, they used to have, mel they used to have songs up to six, seven minutes or the doors, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's almost like a story unveiling with the music and the words. 
So this uh, it's for the modern modern world. When you're listening to something six seven minutes, it may be overwhelming. But actually, you know, when you have a long ride and you can really appreciate, when you're not in a rush, you can really appreciate the the how many instruments they use, and it's it, it's real music. So I like that a lot. I'm also enjoying a lot of the instrumental kind of classic let's say from piano it would be ludovic enaudi mm -hmm. i like a lot of his stuff and then uh of course ian T ian tierson is a also modern uh, uh music composer very interesting one he has uh like a good themes and then uh uh, from uh, russian speaking uh mostly the most popular right now uh that i also like is uh, miyagi there's this guy, it's kind of like a mix of hip hop, Miyagi, and then uh, also my countryman, uh, Max Korsh. Uh -huh. This guy is absolutely, absolutely fantastic because not that it's, and I think his, his style is kind of like a flow. So it's uh, not just not just the music, but also like the sense in it, what he sings about, you know, all these things that our countries go through last three, four years. And he puts it in in a way where nothing else needs to be said. Really? So, yeah. I got to check him out. Max, what's his last name? Max Korsh. Korsh. It goes Korsh. K-O-R-Z-H. Okay. Okay. Z Z H S Z H. Yeah, that's I'm one. That's one band he didn't know. I know. Like uh, <laughs> uh, uh, usually, I I, he knows I know all the bands, but I love having a guy from Eastern yeah. Europe where I don't know some of these. Hey, yeah. when you said he's got a kind of a flow, is it a mm -hmm. little bit like Everlast did? uh a little bit a little bit but he uh, yeah th that style but this guy is extremely artistic if I you can. watch one or two of his music videos of the later ones mm. he, he's like how he puts it in in the words and also his style well wow, it's 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 pretty outstanding you really should uh like uh, check I, it out i can't wait it's tough to understand yeah. i know yeah but i think you'll grab the idea yeah you'll and these the days idea. i can do Google Translate or whatever and get the lyrics. Exactly, uh, exactly. For, for myself in English. Max Korsh. Korsh, can't wait. There yeah. we go. We'll, yeah, look, we'll look him you. up right there. So I always like to ask this question because uh, I think it, it it talks about your personality. So if you're in a band, and you might have been in a band maybe at, at, at mm -hmm. one time, are you going to be the lead singer, the piano player, the guitar player, drummer? Where, where do you sit in the band? You know, where, where is uh, Vladimir? Uh, I would, I, uh, I probably feel like I, it's a drummer. I, I'll tell you why. Okay. Yeah. So drummer is the rhythm guy. Who's yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's the guy who makes sure that there is yeah. energy in the melody, right? but also like controlling the whole stage. Right. I'm a little bit, I think most of the coaches towards the as they maturing becoming a little bit control freaks yeah. <laughs> so i want to be sure you know when you're sitting there and giving the energy but you also like seeing what happens and another part i also feel like uh i kind of feel like uh i i know the momentum how the things happen so sometimes like if you had a, like a guitar where you actually transiting from different tempos and sounds I could also feel myself in that role. I honestly don't think I like to sing a little bit, but I, I don't have enough, uh, like a good voice or good, uh, not, not there. Uh -huh. So I would say a, a drummer or with the guitar. Yeah. Did you have a favorite drummer like Phil Collins? Would you like to sing, you know, have to have a headpiece on and then drum or just straight like drum? Yeah. Oh, okay. I right. like that. Yeah. Yes. I like what he does. And, uh, I like uh, Sting a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, yeah, it, it's very, it's very, it's very, it's very like close to my soul. Yes, when the guy is playing a guitar and singing a song, I like it a lot. This, this is what uh, Ben Howard does. You know, yeah. in uh, yeah. he also has a few. Uh, one of the nice uh, music video where he's just somewhere in California, apparently, like mm -hmm. playing on a balcony. But the, but the energy from the video. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Well, good stuff. All right. We're going to go into the second set now. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Are you a breakfast guy, lunch guy, dinner guy? Where, where do you, you – what's your I'm favorite I'm definitely meal? not a breakfast guy. I'm uh, kind of into doing some uh, intermediate fasting Fast, yeah. that kind of stuff. So I'm trying to give myself like a longer period between dinner until the lunch. So, But I like to get uh, – 
uh lunch like around 12 or 1 it's more like on the go so you get some stuff in the system but uh i like to, to have a big company with the family with the friends for dinner so i'm definitely a dinner guy okay there we go that leads me into our next question all right we we, we like to have uh this conversation with people also too because it, it reveals a lot about your personality so you know, let's say you could invite some people to this uh dinner and we know aj and i would be invited uh Mm-hmm. Four, four or more people. I mean, anybody from like Adam and Eve all the way forward to, you know, today. It could be athletes, no athletes, yes. scientists. It could be fictitious it, characters. Yes. It could be anything. Yeah. So who, who would uh, who's Vladimir coming, Volchkov, yeah. who's coming to the dinner? Yeah. Uh, first would be Andrew Huberman. I like this guy a lot. I listen to a lot of uh, his uh, podcasts. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I like uh, Elon Musk. Smart, oh, smart yes. guy. I knew you would. I could, right, yeah. <laughs> I could feel it because it's the yeah. science, philosophy, yes. and critical thinking. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, uh, it would be Michael Jordan. Oh, the best of the best. Yep, best yeah. of the best. MJ. Yep. And uh, and uh, Mike Tyson. Tyson. Wow. <laughs> wow. That'd, that'd be an interesting conversation. That. Andrew yeah. Huberman, yeah. Elon Musk, Michael Jordan, and Mike Tyson and us. You know? Yeah. And that, that's interesting. I, that's interesting I group. thought Lex Friedman would be in there as well. He's a Russian background, lives here. Uh-huh. Brilliant, brilliant guy. But Huberman, very similar. Yeah. So I, I kind of predicted yeah. it in my head, and I was a little bit off, but yeah. uh, I knew yeah. Musk would be on this list. So at, so at this dinner, what are we serving? What are yeah, we Yeah, what's the food? Yeah, just... Uh, if we if we're here in Turkey, we're definitely going for uh, sea bass or dorada. Oh wow, okay. good They're fish! Unbelievable. I mean, we have a friend. Uh, we have a friend that he's always bringing like fresh levrek. Wow. The, the sea bass is called levrek. Uh-huh. And then uh, we're doing some uh, salads. Uh, some salads. I'm doing the salads for sure. Awesome. I mean, okay. this stuff. This last two months, yeah. I'm just doing. I don't know. I started like picking up the the, the taste. Uh-huh. So I'm the guy doing the salads. And another salad that for sure is going to be on on the table is going to be a large amount of uh, Turkish uh, rucola. They call it here roca, uh-huh. and with some uh, uh, with some pomegranate sauce and a little bit of the of the garlic. So this kind of one mixed salad uh, with some fruits, then uh, ruka salad and fish, and then we go for fish. Beautiful. Or or we go so for some uh, dinner with uh, like lamb dinner. Dinner, I mean, yeah, come they on, know, I love it. They just know how to cook meat here. We actually, as we go down, uh-huh. literally like hundred meters from here, there is uh, one place called uh, Beolu Dinner, dinner uh-huh. and they're making this such a great, very very fine thin uh, pita, and then uh, they make this uh, lamb dinner. I mean, it's just. It, it tastes so good. The Turks are, uh, of course, accustomed to great food. They're not afraid of tomatoes and butter, and that combination is crazy, right? So you good. You know, they have, this, they have this. They have this. Uh, they have this for breakfast. They serve this uh, uh, kind of eggs prepared. It's called menamen. So first they, they, they fry all this, like you said, tomatoes, some yeah. greeneries and stuff. Uh-huh. They make it almost like come up and then they put in some eggs and mix it up. And it's, it's menamen. It's actually not menamen. Bad. I've made something yeah. called shakshuka, I think. Ah, shakshuka. That's similar. Yeah, that's, that's, that's also that type of part. The yeah. difference is in menamen, you're actually like shaking the egg. Okay. In menamen, it stays. I see. In, in shakshuka, it's more. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like right. he, yes, yes, yes. You let the egg kind of like sit on the on this one and fry slowly from from the down. Oh, yeah. I'm, but, I'm, but they're good. I'm gonna, great food. Of great course, country. Max Korj, but I'm also gonna look up a video and maybe make this on Monday. We'll see. Yeah, that, I'm, awesome. I'm getting hungry already. Well, what just a talking great, about great this. dinner party, yeah. an amazing guest, Vladimir. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm interested to, to uh, eat at the dinner table right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Are you awesome. a sunrise or a sunset guy? Are you a sunrise, sunset? Uh, I'm a sunset guy. Sunset. Evening. Mm hmm. Evening. 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 I like. Uh, uh, even though, even though interesting, when I was living back in Belarus, mm. uh, where I haven't been the last two years, but I had my I had my house on the property, and uh, 
the sun was coming right in front of the house and it was like open fields. Mm. So in the morning, uh, somehow when you're living in the nature, pretty like inside nature, you always tend to wake up earlier. It mm. just happens naturally yeah. because you, you pick up that c- c- circadian rhythm and you wake up with the sun. So I would wake up at uh, six in the morning, get myself a cup of tea, put on a wardrobe and just like walk with feet and watch the sun sum up. So, but that's, uh, but that's not uh, something you would do in the city mm. typically. So I'm more of a, uh, like I said, it, it's naturally, you know, after good dinners with, with, with friends or just like sitting with the book, you'd, uh, if you see a uh, setting sun, it's quite something. Beautiful. Yeah. What, what do you like to do in your spare time? What, if you have any spare time, what do you, what, what do you like to do? Uh, I like out on YouTube, like doing crazy stuff. I just like the, <laughs> a lot of this, uh, watching this podcast. And, uh, because I think YouTube is such a powerful tool. You get so much information from there. So many smart guys are ready mm. to share their ideas. And in general, I'm, uh, I wouldn't say that 20 years ago, I, I thought I was pretty like laid back, but now I'm, I liked what technology brings to the world and uh it's uh one of the reasons why I like I like Elon Musk is I think that uh you know we should never be looking back we should be going forward and learning how to cope and how to work with all this technology. Yeah. That's yeah that's a that's a really good answer right yeah. there. All right, let's go to the third set here real quick. Yeah, the third set of the fifth set. Third set of the fifth set, yes. Let's bring it back to tennis real quick. Uh, yeah. First racket. What was your fir- very first racket that, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, we've heard you talk about yeah. tennis when you were growing up. What was your first racket? My first racket was a wooden racket, Vostok. Vostok. Have you heard this one? Is this a yeah. Russian make, right? Y- yes, yeah. yes. It was talk, and uh, back back in that times, it was l- just like with the space. You know, all the space shuttles they yeah. were called either Soyuz or Vostok. Vostok, yeah. and I think of the city so far east in Russia, Vla- Vladivostok. Vladivostok. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Vostok means uh, east, uh-huh. and Vladivostok is the like a uh, holder of holder of east. But the racket was Vostok. And yeah. your name is Vladimir v- with the Vostok. <laughs> Perfect. Vladimir. Yeah. Right. Funny, funny. But listen, th- th- this is like really funny. Oh, I was really in 1998 when I first time uh, uh, qualified and uh-huh. went to the third round in Wimbledon. I was coached by Gary Mueller. I was uh-huh. training in Vienna with G- Günther Bresnik. Uh-huh. Uh, but at that week, I was coached by Gary Mueller who is like unbelievable South African yeah. guy with very warm hearted, like so friendly, but also very honest and very, I think a great coach. So he, I, I was like Vladimir, Vladimir Volchko uh-huh. and he called me Vladi. And then he's like, I'm just going to call you Vladi Vostok. Vladi Vostok. I, <laughs> I always get mixed up with all those Russians. <laughs> I just call you Vladi Vostok. It's too easy. It's too easy to just go Vladi Vostok. So first racket yeah. was a Vostok. Yeah. What do you use? What do you use today? What's your racket of choice today? Uh, right now, I'm so happy with my head gravity. I cannot explain. I think it's one of the best rackets, honestly. I mean, I respect uh, all of the rackets. You know, I'm never going to say that. Uh, but uh, first of all, I've uh, maintained a very good relationship with with head as a company, mm-hmm. and uh, since the times I played, but also with Maria. And then uh, this, uh, I went uh, picking like two years ago, going through different models, and it was just coming out. And I just love this racket. I think it's unbelievable racket, and there is a reason why why Ashley Bart is using it, and then Rublev is using it, and I'm sure a few uh, more. Zverev, Zverev I think. Is using yeah. It. yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great racket. It's a, for me. It's a great combination of uh, of good uh, trampoline, uh, but also stiffness is there. And uh, it's just a good combo of power and and control. Yeah, Easy racket to play you, with. Usually, when a racket is that light, it's not stable. But this one is mm-hmm. very stable, and mm-hmm. it's a big head. And sometimes I don't like the hundred head, but this one is yeah. so stable. Per, maybe yeah. because of the shape of it, the way they shaped it. Mm-hmm. But it's a well engineered. Yeah. Yeah. It's also kind of cool because when you spin it, it's like green, yellow, green, yellow. It's like it's You're like right. two You're different. Right. You're right. I also like that part. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. So yeah. most embarrassing moment in tennis, did you ever have an embarrassing moment like you fell down on the grass and slipped or maybe on, on some clay or, you know, 
Was there an embarrassing moment? Oh man! One time, one time, I was a Davis Cup captain, and we were in South Africa playing Davis Cup, mm. and uh, my player got sick right on the court. Oh. And uh, man, I, I like I, I didn't know what to do. Like, <laughs> you want to help the guy, but then like, what can you actually do? Right. And then and then you like, okay, do you? And then there is like linesmen and uh, and, and ball boys, and they're like. <laughs> Staying there with the towel, and they're like, "Okay, who's gonna do it?" Like, gonna, gonna, oh, right. Sorry, guys, I'm out of here. <laughs> That's somebody else's. <laughs> Not my job. I'm sorry, guys, I'm back to my. I'm back to my seat. I'm on the bench with yeah. my. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it was man. It was pretty like. You know, not. I mean, it's. It's. It's not nothing that you want your player to happen, but also it, it doesn't happen often, and you're like. In shock. Yeah. I would imagine. <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> call Gary Miller up. Yeah, I call Gary South African. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, favorite tournament besides Wimbledon? We probably figure Wimbledon is probably your favorite tournament since you did really well there. Is there a tournament maybe that you played maybe in your country or maybe somewhere else that, that you really like besides Wimbledon? We got him thinking. That's yeah. a good question. Uh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> good one, CB. Uh, I always, I always, obviously, as a Russian-speaking person, I always loved to uh, love to play in Moscow because also I still grew up in USSR, and for us, it was uh, when you're competing on that huge arena in Olympiski, mm. it was something always something outstanding. It was like you're relating to all those great hockey teams and all the best sporting in- events of a huge country. So. Uh, it was. It felt something special, and plus they ran a pretty good, uh, pretty good event there in, in uh, Moscow. ATP, very good mm-hmm. food, uh, good hotels, always, and uh, transportation. But quite honestly, I have to say that uh, we're playing such a good game, such a great sport, and all of the tournaments on the ATP level and uh, on the Grand Slams, I think they're doing a fantastic job to make uh, players feel comfortable. It, it, it almost like. When I say I like Moscow, I understand that it's more emotional, but not technical. Mm. Uh, but it's just a great life to be on a tour playing. Uh, I like how effectively tournaments are organized in the States. I like uh, how they organize tournaments in Germany. It's always German. Like when you're playing in Germany, some tournaments, even challengers, I mean, the way are organized, like top class. If it's an ATP tour event, pfft, you get like best cars in the world, staying in beautiful hotels, you know, mm. food may be a little bit simple, but still very tasty. And just everything, you know, if you say the car, I want the car there at 9.43, it's going to be there at 9.43, not a minute earlier or later. And uh, surprisingly, maybe, but I also enjoyed the uh, tournaments in Japan. You know, I played a few of them there and I went there for, for, for Fed Cup, I think once or twice. And uh, I think those guys are so careful to the detail and they want to welcome you so much. That is just like they show the way they show their culture. It's both very like welcoming, but also very organized and humble. It's amazing. Yeah, that sounds like... Yeah, I, I, I yeah. want to go to Moscow. I've never been there. You know, oh, I'd, I'd like to go over it. there. I'd like yeah. to travel over there just to see all the the history. I'm a history major. That was my major mm. in college. And I really enjoyed history and, and learning about. Uh, I took Russian history, and I thought yeah. that'd be really mm. an interesting uh, uh, city to go to. I mean, I know Russia is like huge, ginormous, of course, it, bigger than America. What yeah. eight time zones or something like that? Something crazy like that. I mean, it's like. And, yeah, yeah, it's a huge country, and Moscow is definitely the city that uh, yeah. worth uh, visiting. And also, it's developed very nice. But uh, of course, unfortunately, like what what happens now, it's uh, probably not an easy place to get to or whatever. I don't know. Like I haven't. Yeah. Yeah, maybe tough, maybe tough sometime topic. in the future. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably going anytime soon. But yeah. uh, who would you have liked to have played in your career that you didn't play? Probably. Yeah, I know you played, played a lot of people. So many. Is amazing, there somebody that yeah. uh, you didn't play that you would like to have played? Um. Of course. Right now, I I would have uh, liked to play 
<laughs> let's say Rafa or Novak. So yeah. I could say that, you yeah. know, I played these guys, yeah. right. but I only played Roger. Uh, and then uh, I played uh, most of the guys that I like to play. And then uh, uh, I think one of the guys that uh, would be interesting to play was Richard Krajcik. Mm -hmm. I really like the guy. I think he had like super big tennis. And then uh, I played a lot of the other guys. So I can't even like, <laughs> funny, <laughs> I cannot yeah. uh, come up with the name, but but it would probably be Richard Krajcik because he's, uh, I always admired his game, big hitter, like yeah. really big hitter, you know? And, uh, but also I think like if you find ways to stick with him, you know, and then uh, you, you will also have uh, a couple of chances. So it's on one hand, he's a super big player, but then uh, you also feel like if you're good enough, maybe you can do it, you know. So that's uh, from my era, yeah. from, from of my era. Even, even though he was already, uh, obviously, in 1996, he won Wimbledon. I won junior Wimbledon. Yeah. That's maybe another emotional kind of like an attachment. A little like connection, yeah. Yeah. And I always felt like he's a super nice guy. Like besides being a great tennis player, I just felt like this guy is, this guy is a extremely nice person and humble. And uh, and uh, I actually saw him a year ago in, in Tunisia. He, I came with his son and he still looks great. He, you know, his feet and um, nice guy. Yeah. Did you have any superstitions or rituals when you were playing? You know, did you have to turn your water bottles a certain way or not step on the lines or? Yeah. So many. It's like if you come to, to a tournament, you eat in one place right. and you win a match, that's it. You're going to eat that food all, all week. And then, uh, and then, uh, and, and then also some, some things with like with numbers would pop up every once in a while and then not stepping on the lines. Uh -huh. And then uh, putting for me crucial was putting the rackets in a racket bag in certain order. Yeah, uh, that was important, and uh, I would always have my racket bag ready the night before. So, like, I just like I felt like mentally I would feel good going to sleep if I know that the moment I open my eyes and grab my bag, I'm ready to fight. That's it. Th awesome. This was important. So I would have already in the evening to make sure that the rackets are strong, the grips are done, and the, the match clothing is already in the in, in the racket bag. And uh, as funny as it is, I, would, I, I mean, you're going to laugh now, but I would hold the first two rackets I was going to use, I would hold them next to my bed. So if I wake up in the night, I would just like feel the racket. <laughs> like I, I, I needed to feel, I needed to feel the, the racket kind of to, to connect with it for the match. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but this was it. Kids, yeah. uh, parents at home yeah. and kids, when you're watching at home, this is a prepared player. That's it. Yeah, yes. this is not a last minute now, idiot guy. Now, did you have this to put your grips on deal. yourself? Did you want to put your grips on yourself? Oh, I know. I'm, I'm a master. I'm a master at that. <laughs> you know, actually, when I was already working as a, in a Maria's in Maria's team, uh -huh. I was the not just a hitting guy and assistant coach. I was also a grip guy. <laughs> and you know, when you're working, when you're working with the uh, with the lady, you know, it, 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 everything has to be perfect. So it, it was like, uh, I, and, and I like, I'm in a way perfectionist. So, you know, I, uh, grips is definitely my thing. Vladimir. Still then almost for all of my players who I work with, or if I'm at the project besides maybe like last one or two, I, I would always like step in and see how the guys grip in the racket and see if we need to tune a little bit. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the, the racket is a, a part of the game for me, for sure. For sure. Vladimir, do you, are you a geek like me? Like, do you make sure the overgrip matches the leather like exact to the millimeter? 
And, Unbelievable. And for me, it's like, okay, this finger, this finger, this finger. I, and, of course, I don't even have a two-hander. But if I did, I'd want the top to be cut and the tape hides everything. I just want the second one to be perfect. And uh, so I think we both do that flat grip. I originally learned yeah. that from Michael Chang's big brother, yeah. Carl. Right. And now Carl, Murray yeah. Murray does it, and you did it for Maria. That's awesome. Yeah. Did, were, uh, were you? At, were, did you pull tight, or did you leave it a little more cushiony? Uh, I think I think right in the middle. Okay, so I like. you feel you feel like when you tie it too much, it's it it feels that uh, stickiness. So you have to be in the middle because you also don't want it uh, to too loose because then then it can actually move a little bit. You know, with the with the with the sweaty hand, yeah. it, it can open up. So you you want that perfect perfect appliance of power where it's it's it, it, perfectly literally yeah you know? yeah and and that's why it needs to be done by a human being that's right. and not just you know sometimes it's her sometimes it's him it's it's us right. it's the same guy yeah, <laughs> Love yeah. It. so i take it if, if the stringer you know strung your racket he didn't do the grip you had to put the grip on absolutely 100 yeah. percent Right. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I know some for some pros, it's therapeutic as well, you know, just to sit there and, and do that routine you know, and just put your put your own grip on or, if you, yeah. you know, trim it or not trim it. I'm a trimmer. I got to trim. I got to make I'm that thing. You. I got to have that and tape. Even though, right. you, even though you're a one hander, you're a trim. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I like yeah. tall grip. I don't when, like, you, when you cut the tape, yeah. when you cut the tape, you yeah. cut it like like this or with the angle a little bit. Angle angle. You got to be like factory. You got to be just like the, the angle. Like, and that way it's yeah. hidden with the tape. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. No, no. I'm, I'm very particular about that. And I got, I like tall grip. I, I hate short grip. I, oh, yeah, I, I, I like it to go up a little higher. All the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. All the way up there. So Looks good. <laughs> all right. A uh, couple more questions, then, then we'll let you go. Uh, if you wouldn't been involved in sports, like Ooh. like in tennis, what would you be doing today? What do you think? Uh, construction. Construction? Mm. Really? What kind? My hobby, uh, my hobby uh, well, two things. Either construction or I would be woodworking. Mm. You know, when I was back at home in Belarus, I set my own uh, kind of like I had this uh, first uh, big room in the house, and then I actually uh, constructed something uh, outside of the house where I put all my machines, like routers, like uh, circular saws, like all the stuff that you need actually to work with the wood, mm. like planer. And I just like, I love the, the, that machinery and uh, when you apply technology to wood, and then you can also personalize per personalize it a little bit, I, I love it. It's just when you when you take something very simple and then do some operations, and then some something beautiful comes out of it, it's just unbelievable. And wow. plus the the like when you're working with the wood, it's you feel it's a living material. Yeah. So that that, that I like, but I also I also admire. Like if I come to the hotel, I want to, I always uh, pick on uh, like how, how, how quality is done. Like, is everything correct? Or is the, you know, something is falling off or how is, is, is the angle right? Or so it, it's just automatically, you know, I like when the things are constructed properly and I actually sometimes like I like to understand why is it not that way. I, I don't know. I maybe something, <laughs> but uh, I like I like to see beautiful constructions. I like modern architecture because I think it's. Uh, I like I used to like classic a lot, and uh, but to me I think the modern world how we are moving. I like uh, where where we are going, and that combination of technology, but also having a lot of wood stone glass fire around and and all that constructed in a harmonious way i think this is like the top of the game so where where you see the technology blending with natural stuff it it takes my breath away you know when you have like nice glass windows and then a beautiful like a fireplace with uh, with stone or with granite or a little bit of marble and then like wood floor and all this and then you 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 take a remote and then the music starts coming and then the light and this is beautiful 
Yeah, no, that's it's that's why he's a brilliant guest tonight. He really yeah, is. I mean, I, I, I can I, see that being very uh, I, I, precise. I, I love your word of the night tonight. That was good. <laughs> All right, last question, and then we'll let you the, let you roll because we've taken a lot of your time right and now right now. We really appreciate. It. If you were the commissioner of the great game of tennis, we always call tennis the great game, and you could make a change or changes in anything or, that you would like to do or not like to do. Maybe you'd like it the way it is and just leave it alone. You know, is there anything that that you might uh, have? as the commissioner uh, Vladimir Volchkov would uh, implement or just leave it the way it is? Uh, there are two things I would do. Uh, first thing is uh, probably take away the five setters or make them a little bit shorter. Mm. Uh, and then the second thing is that I would probably leave uh, Davis Cup or Fed Cup as the countries where you play for your country. And then I almost would uh, like take the flags away anyway. Uh, because I think the world we are living in is becoming very close to each other. And I would want to emphasize on the personality of a person rather than a country or, or this, because it is just a fact of the matter. I mean, you guys in Texas now, I'm in Turkey, originally from Belarus, yeah. but I have so much different cultures in me and I've uh, synthesized it. And uh, I mean, we're literally uh, like a, a step away from each mm -hmm. other thanks yeah. to technology mm -hmm. and that breaks that takes away uh, all the borders like belarus russia usa japan and this and i think i think quite honestly sports should be the place or sports should lead in the direction where we take the stuff that can make us uh take us apart or something we get rid of that we're, we're in tennis, and uh, maybe perhaps what I'm saying is interesting to you, and I like what you do, guys. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's my background that may be interesting to you, and it's interesting for me, your background. So we are communicating on a humanitarian level. You know, it, it doesn't matter, Israel, Turkey, Iran, yeah. Belarus. You know, if you're if you have brain power, if you uh, communicate, if you evolve as a human being, if you go through certain experiences in your life, and that becomes interesting, interested, and then I want people more learn from each other on a personal level. I want less things in the game and in general that divide us. And I want more things that unite us because I've traveled. I mean, you, you know how the touring players live and I've been in the game for, I mean, I started at seven, now I'm 44. I'm yeah. in the game 37 years. I just imagine me, I'm in Moscow, I'm watching the news and blah, 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 propaganda. Yeah. And then, but on a human level, we leave. We go to the restaurant. Yeah, we're humans. We talk, yep. these kids, we talk business. We do our stuff. Uh. The next day, I'm taking a flight to New York. I'm flying there. I put on the CNN, and it's blah, 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 propaganda. But then you go down in the hotel room. You're having your dinner. You're talking to the guys from different countries. You're discussing good food, tennis, poetry, music. Blah. So in all the world, I swear to God, I, I would probably say that 90% of the people – are so humane and so good. And we, we, in general, we're very positive. And there are so many things we can do I, I, in good things. But then for some reason, there's too much capitalization on, on things that divide us. I don't know why is that. Like, I don't want to go into this vaccination and I'm not going to stay in my status, but it's just another example why at the end of the day, it's like, okay, you go left or right. And I don't like that. I don't like that. I want to hear your opinion. Remember in 18th century or whatever, there was this guy, philosopher and writer Voltaire from France. Voltaire, said, yeah. I disagree with you, but I will give my life to make sure that you are able to have your opinion. No, I like that. that. I mean, that's really important. I think everybody has, you can have an opinion, you know, the United States right now, we're kind of divided on 
certain things. Every and, little thing. Right. And it seems yeah. like every week there's yeah. another thing right. that's engineered yeah. to divide us. It's crazy. But how we're doing our podcast on the war, what's yeah. happening in the family, what kind of music, music you're listening to. Yeah. And then it's it's that that's what I'm saying. I'm, yeah. There's so many more things that unite us and actually uh, make us communicate with each other and build something good and create something good, then why should we, why should we emphasize on the stuff that, uh, you know, yeah, that's no. divisive. Yeah, yeah. No. So great, great answer. I, I got to ask one more question before yes, we cut off. Yes. Wimbledon, sure. you get, you get tickets, don't you? Since you're in the final eight, was it the final eight club? Last eight club, baby. Last eight club. Every year they have, they have, do they have two tickets, four tickets for you? How many did you uh, get? So I think you're either coming in and getting, uh, and, and getting a badge mm-hmm. and then a set of tickets for, for a guest. Or if you're not having a badge, you can just take a certain number of tickets for every day. So that's that, that that part is covered. Yeah, I'm so proud I, of you for for that. Oh and man, that's cool. you know they just put up a wall a couple of days ago. Yeah. It's like I don't know. It's something like five meters wide, really? two three meters tall, and it has everybody's yeah. names. And of course, somebody like Serena or Roger or Novak, their name might be this big. And the yeah. people who've been last eight, in your case, last four. A couple yeah. times, their name might be a bit smaller, but I uh, it wasn't high enough res for me to find Vladimir's name, but yeah. we're going to find your name yeah. and blow it up a little bit. Thank you, guys. Thank yeah. you. Vladimir, Thanks for inviting yeah. me. You man. are the best. God bless you, man. man. What a fun guest, and I'm just so much smarter uh, for hanging out with this guy oh, for two man. hours. Yeah. It's so fun. No, we appreciate uh, you getting up early, making the effort. Uh, I think it's easier to stay up a little bit later. I'm a night owl. And I can stay up, you know, till two or three in the morning sometimes. And then, yeah, but to yeah. get up in the morning, whoo, man, that's, that's, you know, we, that's a great effort on, on uh, Vladimir. So the Vladiator, he did it for us. Vladiator. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. It was Vlad- great, great, great talking to you. We uh, loved our time with yeah. you. Please, you, we yeah. keep in touch. And uh, when you're in the States, yeah. we'll uh, either I'll make some of that uh, shakshuka or, or some, some fun egg dish or donor kebabs, or we go somewhere Barbecue. and we show you some of the, Texas Stuff barbecue. Loves, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're barbecue guys. Sounds great. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Thank yes. you, Vladimir. We appreciate your time. Uh, it's, it's been a real honor, real privilege to uh, spend uh, a couple hours on the Zoom uh, with you. And uh, we look forward to catching catching up with you, you know, sometime down the road. Maybe we'll have you back. I've, I've got a whole bunch of other questions. Oh, we have that, so much. You know, uh, <laughs> that uh, we, we go into, you know, the paranormal to, uh, you know, conspiracy theories. You know, we, we can start talking about that also. So too so yeah we'll go even yeah. more philosophy oh yeah philosophy yeah yeah time. oh yeah so we we we, right. we, we have a second uh, page of questions yeah. you know, this this was just yours this we did this much just for you research on, wow. on and oh, there's yeah. more wow. yeah there's, and there's more so but thank you once again vladimir have a great day and uh, we appreciate your time thank you thank you thank you thank Thanks you for again. Guys. Yes. take care all vladimir good. all the best uh, hello from turkey yeah oh, thank you <laughs> Oh, uh, great guest! What a brilliant, oh man, brilliant, Ooh, that was brilliant fun. guy. That was really cool. Golly, I, I hate hate to have to cut that off because yeah. that was just uh, it was awesome just listening to him. He it really was, was. Yeah, he was. He was very interesting, brilliant guest, uh, very convivial. You nailed the word. Uh, you, you, yeah. I'm I, I, I didn't know he was that deep a thinker, it. man. He, he was really. Whew. I mean, I think I said it earlier. He's that crazy, amazing blend of science yes. and philosophy. Yeah, I could see why he yeah. played really interesting tennis and then also to be able to transfer that knowledge onto people about uh you know the game and just uh he gave a really some really interesting answers about people who are in, you know like a rafa roger novak yeah. that are at that level and then the rest everybody else that, yeah. that that are out there that uh and and i hadn't really thought about it that if you're not in the top 10 at an early age, top 20, you're probably not going to get there. You're not going to yeah. be one of those guys. So maybe that's why, you know, American tennis, you know, we've had not that Isner and Opelka and those guys, they're not fine players in their own right. Yeah, which and, the, and John yeah. has touched the top 10 for a while. But it wasn't early enough, probably like an Agassi, Sampras, Curry, or Chang, Chang. Roddick. Those guys hit, hit the top 10 at an earlier yeah. earlier age. So that's, I'm also interested to see what uh, – uh, Carlito Alcaraz does because he hits the top 10 at an early age. I feel it too. Yeah. And I hope he's good enough on
on grass, but he's only 19. You know? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's so it's an interesting point that I never had thought yeah. about. So you learn something new every day. We really did, yeah. and uh, it's one of the reasons I love hanging out with you yep. and these amazing guests. So right. big learning tonight. All right, so let's uh, hit the old exit well, music for I, old outro. James Scott Campbell here. Let's see if we can get him in here. There we go. Everybody, thanks for listening to season one, episode one, two, two of At the Net Podcast. Join us in two weeks. We're actually going to be off next week. This is right. Fourth of July week. Fourth of July week. Yeah, so it's July third. So we'll be off for the Fourth of July weekend. But in two weeks, we'll be talking with Johnny McClam, our buddy Johnny John McClam. McClam from North Kagalaki. And yes. both Wednesdays, I believe we are on. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, we'll so be around. Check us out at the Net Talk Show. Yes. Instagram. Yep. So yeah, Johnny is uh, founder president of Court Harbor, where they they're the creators of the freestanding tennis court divider. So I love that product. Yes, he, it's it, branding and it's very very functional. Yep. So they like said AJ said uh, join us on Wednesday nights. So we do a little thing called tennis shorts, right? We get to find out what's in Craig Bell's tennis shorts. Big fat nothing. So two legs, two pockets, <laughs> at least two things to talk about, right. uh, including Wimbledon. So we'll have a good time with that. All right. A couple couple. Uh, House notes also too. Get your get your uh, brackets in right there for the bracket challenge. You right? have only a few more hours, right. so get it in and look at our Facebook. I'm not going to bore you with the number, but there's like a, a passcode, a pin, yep. a pin number to join our group. And lastly, oh, well, no, no, we want your voice message too. If you want a voice message from this man right here uh, in any uh, of the five uh, Joker. Dom team, Nick, Kit, Dominic, Nick. Murray, and Rafa. It'll be like, uh, it'll be like, what? So. It's Craig Bell's voicemail. No, I'm Rafa Nadal. Yeah. Uh, Craig is on the court. Uh, he going to get back to you. going to work hard. He's going to get back to you as soon as possible, no? <laughs> That's right. So hit, hit us up on that. It's going to be a lot of fun also uh, if you'd like a little voice message. Uh, lastly, be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and other social media outlets. Plus, tell a friend or a friend because we like netheads, right? We like netheads. Share, like, subscribe. You know what to do. And see you Wednesday night at the net. And that's the tennis news as it seems seems to us. us. Good night, everybody from Dallas, Texas. Take care. Thank you.